This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. As morning's gentle light exposes and reveals these beautiful, majestic giants surrounding our vehicle, I wonder what else there's in store for us this morning. Welcome, everyone, to your live African safari. A beautiful herd of elephants here with youngsters and mamas, maybe even some papas in the distance. But they seem to be hiding from us just at this moment. I don't want to move the vehicle too quickly because we are very close to them. But welcome. My name is Michael Anderson. Behind the camera is Gert as always. And we are here at Pridelands Eco Training, uh, watching these elephants as they wake up this morning. It's actually amazing to watch them. They're eating very slowly and gently. It really does seem like a breakfast meal. And we came out here because we heard all the branches cracking. And we found them not far from where they were last night. I wonder if Kumo is also part of this group. Uh, we know there's quite a few elephants here. We'll try and see if we can reverse back and get a slightly better look for us. Ah. Oh, yeah. So the elephants are all still feeding gently over here next to us. And they are very relaxed with our presence. As you see, I'm driving and they don't even look towards us, which is good. It's what we want. We don't want to disturb any animals doing their thing, especially early in the morning. This is their time. You just let me know, Gert, if that's okay. All right. So there you can see the whole family of elephants over here. And the one closest to us here is a female. She's the largest female here, and she definitely looks like she's lactating. So she's probably one of these youngsters around here is one of hers. But you can see there's a little a little bit of a, a wetness just behind her eye there. I don't know if you can notice that. That's called a temporal gland. And that's usually um, got lots of fluid when they're going through some sort of excitement or maybe even stress. And we know it's a very dry time of year. Perhaps she's very thirsty. Oh, got a little bit of sleep in the eye there. I know, it's early. We've put you on camera before you've done your makeup. Well, do you know what? I think you're beautiful nonetheless. Look at those very soft eyes. Beautiful eyelashes as well. Look, you can see all the thorny sticks around here. So she's got those long eyelashes to protect herself as she pushes these trees and branches. Oh, and you can hear her pushing some right now. As she reaches that trunk down amongst these fallen branches in order to pluck these green leaves. amazing to to watch them up close like this something we we can do when we're nice and quiet and calm oh, she's going to walk right next to us she's actually quite quite a big a big female you can just see the tinges of red on her on her skin just behind the ears and on her forehead as well we saw as we drove out this morning lots of places where it looked like the elephants had dust bathed so maybe throwing a bit of dust on their skin. Maybe there was a few uh, biting insects fluttering around this morning. She's like, oh, she looks like she's really enjoying those. Look at those, that smiley mouth. Laura, I think it is going to be a great drive. We are starting with elephants, which are, you know, firm favorites of most people. Um, so, yeah, I wonder what else this morning has in store for us. <laughs> Look at this little, this little one. They really, it looks like it's happy. You can see this little, looks like it's got a little smile, a little smirk on its lips. It's always good starting with elephants. It really puts you in a nice, calm mood. Especially elephants like this just seem like they're really accepting us, especially when they've got babies like this. You know, for them to, to come so close to us like this really shows that they are allowing us into their, their life. Well, we're going to enjoy these elephants and see what they do over the next little while. I think they might go and drink soon. We're going to send you over in the meantime to Barney with the jackal. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to and Beyond Ngala. 
We, it's a beautiful morning, a little bit chilly. We have just spotted a black backed jackal that has quickly run across the road. And she looks like she's quite heavily pregnant. We can only see her now as uh, she trots along and move away from us. It does look like she's also got a full baby, not only from the pregnancy. She might have been successful overnight. This black backed jackals normally in pairs and we don't see the other mate at this moment in time but there's a chance that it's somewhere in these beautiful open areas right where we are so we are gonna go right into the central part of the reserve see if the pride of lions that have visited our neighbors yesterday morning has come back and see if we can track them down and see what we can find this morning It's a beautiful all morning indeed. We are a little bit chilly as it starts, but it's gonna warm up quite quickly. Beautiful sky coming from the east, the sun is about to rise. My name is Bunny, and we have Owen behind me as our cameraman for the day. And we are excited for this day and hoping to see what the lions were up to overnight in our neighbors and if they decided to come visit us again this morning. So we will send you over to Steve to go also say good morning and we'll take it from there. Good morning and good morning everybody. Welcome to Juma Private Camera Reserve where it is very chilly this morning. My name is Steve, joined by Nelson Camera, and we are very excited to have you with us. Welcome on board. Please jump on board, get your coffee, get your blankets, your buff, hot water bottles, whatever it is you might need. And uh, don't forget, we are live and interactive. We'd love to hear from you. Please send the questions, comments, using the hashtag Wild Earth. Throw them in on the YouTube chat stream or Twitch, whichever is your preferred platform. And, um, Trying to warm up my lips. Woo. <laughs> Need to do some lip exercises in the morning. I haven't spoken for like about 10 minutes and the lips have kind of lost a bit of their function. So, first thing we're going to do this morning is just ascertain where the pride went last night. Figure out whether they're still on the property. It's always nice to establish those things. And then my ultimate plan after that is to do a little bit more searching but while I do searching I'm going to be focusing on a medicinal plant this morning on a wonderful segment known as traditional Tuesday which because it's Tuesday and not Monday so that makes sense <laughs> so we'll get to that we're just about to get to Buffelsuk Dam have a little look the lions are sort of headed in that direction last night I doubt that they just went to the dam to drink but a nice area to come and check that's right up on the northeastern boundary as well so some nice game paths and trails we're just reading the morning newspaper on this wonderful Tuesday and who knows you might just bump into them um, it's quite incredible how far though they can actually move in an evening so it's we're quite a few hours behind them, so who knows if we will find them or not. But I'm not the only one out and about this morning. Shishal and Adu, she's out. She's also, also cold, but she'd like to say good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome aboard. How wonderful yet again to be with you. We have a very beautiful jelly tot type of sky. I absolutely love it. It's not my fault that I associate most of the colors of the sky with food, but I just find them so pretty. As the sun is peeking out. Just gorgeous. Now it's chilly.
chilly archer at Juma, 10 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And I know that Steve is busy tracking, trying to find the Incahumas. And I'm hoping for a bit of leopard luck. Let's just enjoy the sunrise for a minute. Some of the birds are starting to get a bit noisy. The morning chorus has begun. Lovely. So our plans, like I said, hoping for a bit of lip luck in the morning. Best time would be the first half an hour of our, our sunrise drive. That's when you find them kind of cruising about haven't picked up on any tracks just yet. Have checked out Gallego Pan and along that road, but only the tracks from the lions last night. I would also love to pop by the den. I haven't met Corky's little cub. Linda Poli, you say, here comes the sun. Here it comes indeed to warm us up. What a, an appreciation the entire planet has for this gorgeous ball of fire. And there it is, popped over the horizon. Just stunning. Wonderful. All right, well, my name is Trishala with BK on camera, and I'm going to send you over to Damon and see what his plans are for the morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to and Beyond Funda Private Game Reserve. My name is Damon, and behind the camera this morning, we've got Marcel. And we've come out into the open grasslands on the far south of the reserve in search of cheetah and rhinos. And we've managed to find the latter. Have a look over there. And now, of course, Murphy's Law, she's decided to start to feed her way into that thicket there. But there is a big white rhino cow. And if we're patient, we might just get to see her little calf. When we arrived here, it was kind of toddling around next to its mother. It's quite a small calf, barely coming up to her belly. So I'm sure if we just watch long enough, we'll get to see it coming out, exploring its surroundings. Just looking at its size, like I said, its back just comes up to, it, to its mother's belly. So it's probably between three and four months old. So still kind of the same size as, a, as an adult warthog. And at this age, because they are pretty much dependent on mom's milk, they don't do very much feeding of their own, or feeding on grass, um, that is. And so they'll, they'll often kind of move around mom and play and explore their surroundings. So I'm sure if we wait here long enough, we'll get to see it come out. There were a couple of impalas that were feeding around there too, and it was quite cute to watch the little rhino go and investigate the impalas. Parlors, of course, didn't really know what to make of it and moved out. There we go. Now, just mum's back for the time being, sticking up above the bushes. Oh, there's mum's head coming out and grazing. I'm sure if we watch there for long enough, we'll see the little calf. See her ears swiveling around. 
Can I see if I can see where that little one is? I think it must be just on the other side of that bush or on the other side of its mother. But see that big thicket up there? So I wouldn't be surprised if last night and in the early hours of the morning with it being so chilly, if this mother rhino didn't take her little one into that thicket to try and keep it sheltered from this chilly wind that's blowing. And they would have huddled up there together and slept for the night. It's actually comparatively warm this morning compared to what it's been in the last couple of days. And I think that's why this rhino, it's the first time we, in, in a while that we've seen rhinos being active at this time of the morning. And I think it's just with that slightly warmer temperature. But she's definitely now taking advantage of it. Look how she's grazing. Every now and then just stopping to lift her head. Megan, you're saying that you love those ears. They are amazing to watch, eh? They, how they swivel around independently of each other, almost like a, like a chameleon's eyes, if you will. And also just speaking about those ears, let's have a look now. Next time that she lifts her head, oh, mind you, we can see it pretty well from here. But Megan, look at how big those ears are compared to, if you look carefully, at, just at the bottom of where her head is meeting the grass, you might be able to see her eyes how big her ears are compared to her eyes. It just shows you which of her senses are kind of more important to her. And there's her massive body coming through there. Oh, I'm hoping that as her rear end passes, we might get a glimpse of that little calf. There's her tail. Oh, there's the calf. The calf is right behind her. It's gonna come into the gap now. It's turning around. Oh, come on, little one. You've got us all waiting in suspense. I wonder what it's doing. Maybe it's, because it's kind of standing dead still. I wonder if it hasn't maybe found something interesting to smell or maybe some very nice or particularly lush grass. Like we said they are at this age it won't be it won't be feeding very much on solid food but it will it will have already had its first taste of grass. Here it comes, look at its little ears. Oh, I think it is grazing. Here it comes. Oh look at that little baby <laughs> Gremlins General, you're saying that rhinos kind of look like the big version of warthogs. And Gremlins General, just because you've said that, I've got a, a story, a very funny story to tell you. So, a couple of weeks ago, uh, or quite a while ago, we were out doing some walking training. And the ranger that was attempting um, this walk where we try to approach um, large animals like rhinos or elephants or buffalo on foot to view them, and our objective is always to make sure that the animal never knows that we are there and to view the animal and then to get away again without the animal once again realizing that we're there. And this particular ranger, um, he had spotted some rhinos off in the distance. And we were, the objective was to try and approach the rhinos on foot. But of course we couldn't see them from where we'd started our walk. And so we started to pick our way along a game trail through the thick bush. And we came around a corner and suddenly I, heard, I saw a bit of movement at the back of our group and I turned around and I could see that the, the people at the back of the group had spotted something and they had gotten the, the attention of the assessor on the walk and they were busy pointing at something and then we all looked where they were pointing and we all noticed this very small rhino calf that was standing maybe about 50 meters away from us. And now as a rule of thumb, we normally don't try to approach rhinos with small calves on foot just because those calves are very inquisitive. Like I said, they don't, they don't feed or they, they, they don't eat grass very much. They, they get most of the nutrition from suckling from mum. And so that leaves them with a lot of free time to explore. And, and so they, if you were to be sitting there trying to watch them, they might come out, accidentally find you, squeal, and then mum might be quite... Will, will, they, will then come to the, to the defense of her calf. So we don't walk rhinos with small calves. 
Anyway, so we all had seen this little rhino, but the ranger that was attempting to lead the walk hadn't. And he, so, and eventually when he did see it, he picked up his binoculars and he looked at it for a good bit of time and then looked back at us and said, not to worry guys, it's just a warthog. At which we all, <laughs> our eyes all went wide and we all just stopped in our tracks and then our assessor then tapped him on the shoulder and said, no, 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 take a close look there. And he realized that it was a little rhino and we got out of there pretty quickly. But Gremlins General, sorry, that little comment reminded me of that. <laughs> I hope that that ranger in question is listening. Um, we're going to try, I think, just because she's gone up into that thicket there, we're going to try maybe get a, a slightly different angle. And um, we're going to try get a different, a different angle and try to get a new, another view of this rhino. In the meantime, though, let's go and have a look at what Mike has got for you. So we are still with our gentle giants, and they've moved a bit more out of uh, the open and into these sort of sparse, spiny thickets, as they like to do, because this is where the tasty grass is still hidden from you know, other other herbivores, so they can still find a little bit of food. But it's wonderful just to watch them. They're still so calm, still in breakfast mode. I know until I've had my my breakfast and my coffee, I'm not really... Um, doing too much activity. So these elephants are much the same. Just calm and relaxing. You can really see how she how she uses her trunk. She pulls and pushes her head down, plucks out the grass and the roots. And you can see those tusks well worn from years and years of digging and scraping and collecting bark. Hey there. Slowly moving her ears, listening, always listening around. I mean, she's got a whole family with her, babies and everything. So she needs to, you know, keep always an ear out. I know they're not threatened by many predators, but the youngsters, as you're going to see now, are still quite small. And so if there was a lion pride around here, mum would have to be vigilant and careful, making sure that they're not threatened by anything. You know, what, what we've seen before is sometimes lions are sleeping uh, in thickets not far from elephants and maybe the wind is not quite right and they don't see them and one elephant just wanders up and surprises them of course lions almost always move out the way for elephants but gives everyone a huge fright the lions don't like it the elephants get a fright it's all very funny and this one small elephant but with rather large tusks for such a youngster Lemon Lime the Wolf, you've asked if I've ever seen a big tusker, and yes, absolutely, I have seen quite a number of big tuskers around the Kruger, parts, the Kruger Park and the surrounding reserves, the part of the Greater Kruger. In fact, here at Pridelands, there is one uh, legendary elephant called Izzelweenie, who is one of the newer tuskers of this part of the Kruger. Hopefully, we'll get to see him in the next little while. Uh, I don't know if he's around at the moment. We haven't seen him for a while, but he is absolutely magnificent. His tusks are uh, incredibly long. I think if he just dipped his head down slightly, his tusks could be able to touch the ground. That's how uh, that's how big they are. And uh, tuskers are, you know, generally elephants that have tusks that are magnificent in size. I'm not sure the exact weight that makes a tusker, but probably more than 50 kilograms each kind of size. Uh, very very massive uh, tusks. And there's a there's a wonderful museum. If you ever get a chance to come uh, to the Kruger National Park in a rest camp called Lataba, it chronicles the lives of seven elephants that were named the Magnificent Seven, and they had massive tusks. I don't know if many of the Magnificent Seven are still around with us today, uh, but they are. They left a legacy of youngsters who are going to have huge tusks. So that one that's just on the left there, um, just behind the smaller one, the small one has no tusks at all, so it's very young, probably less than three years old. But the one behind it is not much larger, but already its little tusks are quite long. So it's probably got some tusker genes in it somewhere. Yeah. Maybe it'll grow to be a tusk. I don't know if it's a male or a female. I didn't actually look carefully, but if it is a male, it will probably grow quite large. It's all to do with the genetics. Still, you see that one there is getting greedy. It's just shoving mouthfuls and mouthfuls of grass into its mouth before it even finishes the first. And when you've got siblings, you learn to eat quick, real quick. 
Isn't it just so gorgeous how the how the light's just touching these elephants gently through these trees? It's a really golden light this morning. Uh, this A little bit of wind last night just put a tiny bit of dust in the air, and so it's really, really uh, gently settling, and during that time the golden light is just wonderful. It's a phot photographer's dream. We're going to continue following these elephants. It's probably the best thing I've done in a while. So whilst we do so, enjoy it. Thanks, Mike. Wonderful to see large elephants, isn't it? I am. Um, we don't get to see too many of them here. On Juma, big tuskers. Okay, so just to give you an update, we are apparently where the lions were left last night. They were moving, and now I only know that because I can see the vehicle tracks from where someone who was with them turned around. But um, I can't find a lion track, which is quite, quite disturbing. How an entire pride of lion has not left one single mark on the ground. How is that possible? How is that possible? So it's very hard for me to figure out a direction to check if, um, if they don't pop out or they don't show a foot on the ground. There we go. There we go. I found some. Finally. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it very clearly. Not, eh, Niels? Not very clear. But uh, yes, Emma. Emma wants to know, did they grow wings? They did. Lions have this ability, everyone, to grow wings and fly away. <laughs> they came from that side. We'd said a dam is there. And uh, then their tracks... So obviously he followed them through here, but the other tracks are coming straight here. Straight down towards the world's nicest jackalberry tree. Yes, you're right. It is a beautiful morning to hug a tree. I'm going to hug this beautiful stalwart of a jackalberry. My first tree hugging since I've been back. So bear with me. It was a wonderful thing to do. At the same time, I'm sort of checking to see where the lions have gone, but we're hours behind them. Tracks head in that direction. Look at this beautiful thing. Beautiful jackalberry. This guy has got stories to tell, I am sure. Mm. Ah. When last did you give a tree a little squeeze, everybody? When last did you give a tree a squeeze? This beautiful tree has often got giant eagle owls in it. Often this area is a great place for Tlalamba, Tingana, Tandi. I'm waiting one day to find one of them in this wonderful tree. Okay, so those tracks have come across here. We've gone around that way, saw nothing come out. Which means that um, it could be inside. So let's go have another look. Always nice to just double check. Nice to get off the vehicle as well and stretch the legs a bit. Lips are slowly started to, do, to defrost. It is one of the colder mornings today. Okay, so they walked through the block there from the dam and that's the general direction. So it's directly sort of southeast. So I didn't check Hyena Road because um, Hyena Road is not the nicest road to track on. But we'll go and have a look anyway. Okay, well while we get around the corner, go see where the lions might have popped out at. Trishala, I think, is trying to be rather funny. Um, FC is on, game drive is on, here we go. Okay, 
Uh, I haven't seen that sign. They should. Welcome back, everyone. Apologies, we've had a bit of a technical difficulty there. Once again, of course, we are out in the middle of the African bush, so it can be quite tough to make sure that all technical issues are completely in line at all times. But we are still with this mother rhino and her little one. And for the time being, they're not really giving us <laughs> the best views of themselves. They seem to be sticking to those, those thickets over there, trying to block out a bit of this, this chilly breeze that's blowing. And I think also, just based on the fact that this, look at how this rhino cow, she's had her head down basically the whole time that we've been here, with the exception of that once or twice when you were last with us, when she lifted her head and listened and looked around. So she's obviously got some, some pretty good grazing over there. Some tasty, nutritious grass that both her and her calf seem to be enjoying. We haven't seen the little one for some time, so I think it's maybe lagging a bit behind her. Maybe once again found a particularly tasty little patch of grass, and I don't think it's going to be long before we get rewarded with another view of that adorable little rhino calf. Alicia, you're asking if rhinos lie down when they sleep or if they stand up like elephants often do. Alicia, they'll lie down. Um, a little bit like a, I suppose somewhat similar to how a cow lies down. So they won't lie down directly on their tummies. They'll lie down kind of on their, on their side, if you will. Um, if you can imagine an animal with such a big round belly. But yeah, so their legs will be kind of out in front of them and they'll be kind of propped up on that big round side of theirs but their head will be resting on the ground. And at least that's one of my absolute favorite things to watch rhinos sleeping, especially when they're sleeping in very dusty places, because whenever they breathe out, those lungs are so big, all the air gets forced out through their nostrils and it makes this big plume of dust in front of them. It's absolutely amazing to watch. So no sign of that little one just yet, but I think that it's not going to be long before we do get another little view of it. It's going to be quite funny though, because look at how long that grass is. I don't even think its back is going to be able to... In fact, everyone, I don't even think we're going to be able to see it. That grass, <laughs> the grass is too long. Because remember we said that its back kind of came up to just above where its mother's belly hangs down to. And looking at that grass, the grass comes up quite far up, that, up, up the mother's belly. So I don't know if we are going to get another view while it is in that long grass but we can certainly enjoy being able to see the mother well as i say that she goes behind a bush <laughs> murphy's law now where she's going i don't know if we are going to be able to get another view of her everyone so i think we might move out of this area for now and i'm quite keen this morning to go and look for some cheetah and with us being in this particular part of the reserve there's quite a few different cheetah that we can go and search for there is that mother with her, the two smaller cubs those of you that were watching a couple of days ago we spent some time with her and her two little ones when they were climbing that fallen over marula tree so we can go and try and look for them there's also very exciting news and that the mother with the three very small cubs um, has been seen. I don't know if you remember that from where Clive and, uh, and, and Jared showed them to you a couple of weeks ago. So they've also been seen quite recently, so we can go and try and look for them. And then there's also a pair of, of relatively young males that are starting to establish a territory of themse for themselves. And that's another option for us to go look for. But they've all been pretty much in this area around us. So hopefully we'll be able to find at least one of those three groups of cheetah. Um, I've just been listening and I've heard some alarm calls coming from the hillside just behind my back here. There's quite a few impalas up there. So it could be that they've seen a cheetah and that they're alarm calling at it. So we're gonna head in that direction, go see what those impala are alarm calling at. In the meantime though, let's go see what the elephants are up to with Mike. Cheetah nice. So 
we're still enjoying this beautiful elephant herd and we've just heard before you joined us a rumble coming from one of the large females at the back and that's maybe an indication that they are going to do something different soon maybe she's saying to them okay finish up your last little bit before we move on to a new area which would be interesting because our dam close to the eco training camp in Lovu dam is very very close uh, so maybe they'll go and drink there Oh, I was just wondering, earlier we were talking about tuskers. I was just looking up what was the biggest elephant ever seen. Yeah, 11 tons, an, an, an elephant in Angola, which is very, very interesting because 11 tons is far heavier than most elephants are nowadays. And in Africa, there are about 30 big tuskers left in total. That includes the ones in South Africa and East Africa and anywhere in between. So I was wondering, have any of you at home seen a tusker before on any of your African safaris you've been on? Anyone ever seen a tusker on a safari? And if you have, we'd love to know about it. I haven't seen too many tuskers. I've seen Izzelweenie. And I've seen another elephant, although I didn't know its name at the time, in the group park also. A huge, huge elephant bull with huge tusks. None of these have huge tusks, but most of these are youngsters, young males and uh, females. And mothers, of course. And the female elephants never get tusks quite as big because they're, they're not fighting uh, the dominance of females. They're just doing their thing, looking after the youngsters. And of course, tusks are important weapons, but you don't need huge tusks to defend against a lion if your baby's in, in danger. Your huge size is probably just enough. And as a tool, again, if it's too large, it's just going to be cumbersome. Sometimes those really huge elephants, you really see them struggling with their tusks, you know, bumping into them. Well, not really struggling, but it must be something they have to think about quite a lot. My light is still so soft, actually, I feel it on my skin, just nice and warm. It's, it was not so cold last night as it has been previously, but still cold enough that these elephants are still really enjoying the sun on their skin, I'm sure. Being large animals, it takes a while for them to warm up if they do get cold. So many of them, so calm. There's... There's a wonderful reserve in South Africa. It's called Tembi. That place has got amazing elephants. I think they say that it's the last genetic tuskers left in Southern Africa. You know, originals that haven't been translocated or moved anywhere. So any tuskers there have been there since, you know, forever. It's amazing. I've had the privilege of being there once before, and I had one of those tuskers amble past the car. It was huge. I think the tusk was probably longer than my whole body. Amazing. It was on my actually it was on my first ever safari. Karen, I think it was Karen, maybe Taryn. Beautiful name either way. Karen. Um, you saw an elephant once that had tusks so long that they were touching the almost touching the ground and then curve curving up again as well. That's amazing. Often we see elephants with very, very big tusks being almost straight in, in, their, in their shape. And so when you get those big curved, especially if they're symmetrical, it's really, really nice to see. Uh, a lot of these elephants' tusks are curving quite a lot, uh, but they're very short, so they're not getting in the way. I think having a nice curved tusk is probably quite useful, because the closer it is to your eye level, I suppose, the easier it is to use the tips of the, of the tusks to do certain tasks, like cracking branches or scraping bark, that kind of thing. Actually, I wonder if there's, a, if there's sort of an optimum size of the, of the tusks. You know, if they're too big, are they, are they then actually just getting in the way and not really useful? It'd be interesting to know. I wonder if there is any research about you know, best tusk size. Oh, there's some tiny little babies in this group as well. One that I didn't see before. Oh, I don't know if you heard that another little rumble. They're uh, moving off. The ones on the left now are moving off towards the towards the waterhole in the direction of the waterhole. I don't want to. I don't want to jinx it. I hope they do go to the water. But yeah, that's another rumble. So more and more rumbles happening, meaning that it's probably about time for them to go and have their breakfast. Hmm. I wonder. There's the small one. There's the small one just there. 
Just walking in behind that one, which I said has quite big tusks for a youngster. Very, very tiny. And we say that when they can fit under the mother, they must be around about one years old. If they can't fit under the mother anymore, but they don't have little tusks, then it means they're probably around about two years old. And then, oh, I'm pushing that one. Young elephants can be such bullies sometimes. That one was just giving that one a poke up the bum, saying, get out of my way. I'm on my way. So, what we're going to do while we follow these elephants, if they go down to the water, we're going to send you over to Trish, who's got some drongos following a different type of animal. Deb, that drongo will be having a feast. It's so close to the zebra, and it's watching it as it moved across. Drongo had its head down watching. Are you disturbing anything that might be tasty to me? Of course, you've got some ox peckers on the zebra as well. Yes, a very intimate cleaning going on there. And you can see that the zebra is very obliging because it's letting, letting it, that ox pecker get into all of the necessary regions by lifting the tail. The tail protects some of the most sensitive parts, and those parts also may need to get a cleaning from any pests that manage to make their way around there. Good job, Red Bull Dox Pecker. Our Drongo is still in position, waiting for the insects to be disturbed. And these beautiful zebra. And a really nice open section of the reserve. We're here on Zoe's Road. Nice open plain here. You see the zebra feeding there. And across, we have some wildebeest feeding too. lovely to watch all these animals feeding together and benefiting from each other's movements. Lovely. All right, well, it seems that Damon has finally found what he's been looking for. So let's go see. Well, everybody, that didn't take very long at all. And thanks to our tracking vehicle, we've managed to find that mother cheetah and the two younger cubs. And have a look at the scene behind them. This is almost surreal. I don't think that... I don't know if a, if a Disney movie could come up with a better scene. My goodness, it's absolutely insane. This mother cheetah's perched up on a bit of a rocky outcrop. Not far from where we could hear those impala alarm calling. But looking around, I, I don't see any impalas looking in her direction. So I wonder if they weren't maybe alarm calling at something else. But... Just having a look at those cubs' tummies as they were walking around and looking at mom's body language. See how she's looking off to the left, down into the valley. There's a lot of zebra, a lot of impala down there. So I think they do look quite hungry. And, oh, look, there's a yawn. Butterfly, you're saying cheers to these cheetah. Butterfly, I definitely agree with you. I think that even though, like I said, there were quite a few different cheetah we could go and look for in this area this morning, I'm very relieved that we've managed to find at least one of the groups that I said that we might be able to find this morning. And cheers to them for being up on such a beautiful lookout. I hope that all of you are getting some wonderful screenshots silhouetted against the, against the rising sun behind her there. 
And what a spot. Remember we said with that white rhino and her calf, how she was taking her little ones, or her little one rather, into the thickets to keep it uh, warm and safe from the cold. I think that's what this mother cheetah is doing here too. See this, this open hillside, kind of sheltered from the wind, from because it's coming from, from over, over the back of the vehicle currently. So she'll be sheltered there, but also with the kind of the slope of the hill facing towards the east, she'll be able to warm up nicely in the sun. And then also, like we said, scan down the hill, looking for, for an impala to catch maybe. For the time being look at her back and how arched it is i don't know if any of you've got a cat at home and when it's feeling cold it'll often sit with its back hunched up like that i think she's just soaking up the warm rays of the sun and the cubs look for the time being content to do the same look at how they're sticking quite close to their mother We can't see them too well, but have a look on the, the left hand side. You might just be able to see the one's head sitting close to mom, keeping warm. Oh, this is just surreal, everybody, this, this scene. And wouldn't that be exciting? I think this one, like we said, this was our plan for the morning. So, <laughs> Emma's saying she's waiting for the Lion King soundtrack to start playing. Uh, I think it would, uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to play it now because it would disturb the cheetah, but if any of you at home have got it handy, maybe, yeah, I'd suggest playing it in the background and try it on for size, maybe send it off to a film production company and see what they think. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, this was our plan for this morning, was to try and find these cheetah. And I'm very excited now. So seeing that her tummy is empty, or at least her cubs' tummies are empty, that means there's a good chance that her tummy will be empty because a mother cheetah like this will normally let her cubs feed first on a kill that she makes. So if their tummies are empty, there's a good, a good chance that her tummy is pretty empty. And that being said, a good chance therefore that a little bit later on, once she's warm, that she might try to hunt. And, oh, I've just seen some impala, everybody. Some impala have just come over the rise in front of us. At the time, or currently, there's not very much cover where those impala are. So it will be quite a tough, a tough stalk for her. So I think she's just going to bide her time. And we'll see maybe if a little bit later she does try to... Well, there's our answer, yeah. But now it's more important to try and keep warm. But it bodes well for an exciting morning for us, everybody. Look at how that female cheetah, look at how her ears are pricked forward. Oh, but also kind of flattened out to the side. So trying to keep her profile as little as possible, or as inconspicuous as possible. Jessica Jones, you're asking how long these cheetah have gone without food. Jessica Jones, the last time that we saw these particular cheetah was, if I'm not mistaken, probably about four days ago. And you may remember if you were watching that evening, we were following her down into a valley and we then left them at kind of at sunset. The next morning, another vehicle came to look for her. And they found her with an impala, an impala kill. So she had obviously killed an impala either just after we left her or in the very early hours of that morning. Well, not very early, but just probably just after sunrise. Um, so it's probably been about three days or so, Jessica Jones at the very least, that she's been without, or at the most, that she's been without food. We don't know if she has killed something between then and now. Um, we haven't seen her since then. But looking at those cubs' tummies, they don't look, it's nothing to be alarmed about, but yeah, they look like they could do with some food. And it looks like, look at how her ears are now pricked up again. And she's looking down the hill. 
So I wonder if she's maybe spotted something down in the valley. Just so fantastic to see her up here. We're definitely going to stick around. And maybe when you come back to us, we'll be looking at her from a slightly different view. So our beautiful morning scene is still unfolding for us. The what I suppose might be the matriarch, or at least one of the older females, did rumble a few times, and they moved on a little ways, but they've stopped underneath this large knob thorn, close to these green bushes, and they're feeding again. Perhaps she was just telling the furthest members of the group to catch up, rather than saying, we're leaving now. Because remember, they can communicate over huge distances. Some say over 15 kilometers on a cool, still morning, that they can, the, the sound can travel, those low, infrasound waves, slow rumbles. Most of them we can't even hear, so that which we were hearing wasn't as far distance. But just they've stopped underneath these trees and they're just feeding on some of the bushes. I'm watching them use the dexterous trunks and the tusks in unison to crack them. Today's a tusk morning. I keep looking at the tusks and just watching how they use them. You know, using them to snap the branches and also as they as they curl up the grass sometimes to store it, just they hook it sometimes just between the lip and the and the tusk. It's very funny. If you've ever seen something like a chipmunk or a squirrel stuffing nuts into its cheek pouches, it's almost the same with an elephant, except they don't have cheek pouches. They've just got these tusks that they just stuff the food under and they just hold it there for a while as they collect more. It's very interesting to watch. If you Look closely at the grey bodies, you can see lots of scratches all over them, but it's not really uh, deep scratches, they're just light scratches, especially on the ears. Scratches from all the bushes that they push past. Remember, in most cases, elephant's skin is very thick, but they're quite sensitive. You, know, you almost never, ever see an oxpecker sitting on the back of an elephant, whereas you see them often sitting on the backs of you know, rhinos and buffaloes and even impalas. Elephants, although their skin is thick, they're very, very sensitive, so they do not really like at all to have those sharp little um, claws on the feet of oxpeckers and other birds sitting on them. Not always. I mean, I have seen large birds sitting on them. Liz, you're wondering if rhino and elephant skin is similar in thickness? I suppose in some places, yes, in some parts of the body, sure, it's probably quite similar. But I know that rhino skin is tougher and thicker because they uh, need to protect themselves, especially the male rhinos. You'll see the skin, especially around their shoulders and neck, can sometimes be two inches, oh, wait, hold on, five centimeters thick. Yeah, just over two inches thick. So that is very, very thick, leathery hide to protect it when they fight head on, pushing each other with those horns. I mean, many rhinos actually get killed in fights with other rhinos because of those sharp horns. Uh, but elephants tend not to kill each other when they're fighting. Generally speaking, elephants know uh, who's bigger and stronger and the fights don't last that long. Not always the case, of course. And sometimes they can get quite aggressive and they can kill each other as well. But uh, rhino skin is, I think, generally speaking, thicker than the skin of an elephant. Some parts of the rhino, like behind the ears, um, under the groin, the under the, the, sh the shoulders, so like the armpits, I suppose, which you'd call, uh, are very, very soft and sensitive. Um, I've seen many uh, rhinos really targeting those areas when they need to have a good old scratch, because, of course, it feels nice for them. That's where all the ticks and things gather, and it feels nice to give those softer areas a good old scratch. Oh, there's old Bubba. Earlier on, we saw Bubba trying to suckle. I wonder if Mama is uh, trying to start the process of weaning. It takes a while, a couple of years, uh, maybe up to three years before an elephant really gets weaned, although sometimes it can last a lot longer, sometimes not as long. All depends. Amazing, different animals wean at different times. Weaning is when they stop drinking milk and go into fully onto solid food. And this, I remember once not long ago, I saw lions and there was about a three-year-old lion trying to suckle off of a lactating mother with very young cubs. And the mother didn't stop it. It was so, so weird to see basically a fully grown lion trying to suckle. Oh, got a bit of a fright from the branch. Don't worry, the branch is not going to hurt you. This, this elephant's so short, the grass is taller than it. That's sweet. It hasn't got that fuzziness, though. It hasn't got the fuzziness that, uh, that very, very tiny baby. Yeah, that's right. You eat that branch, the one that gave you a fright. You showed her who's boss. 
more belly rumbles. Perhaps they're going to move again. I see the first elephant, the the, the larger mother, has, has, has moved further. So they're getting closer to the dam, slowly but surely. I think after this, we're probably going to leave these elephants and let them get close to the dam. And then uh, once they've gotten close to the dam, we'll come back to them. just want to scout around and see what else is about. Wild Earth relies on support from viewers like you to carry on broadcasting our daily live shows. A small donation goes a long way in helping us on our mission to connect the world with nature. Please visit our support page to see how you can help and become part of the Wild Earth family. Well, we thought the view couldn't get any better. Um, I think it might have just gotten a little bit better. Look at this, everyone. We're looking up at this mother cheetah and her little ones up on this little rocky outcrop. Look at how they all huddled together. Almost like a, like a perfect family portrait. <laughs> Once again, I hope that you're all getting some screenshots, or oh, especially when she looks at us like that. What a magnificent creature. Look at those little cubs, how they've got their chests puffed out, and how their attention is focused down in the valley. Meanwhile, Mom, looking down at the valley too, but having to obviously keep an eye on things behind them as well. Just making sure there's nothing behind them that she needs to be concerned about, either prey or, or potential danger. But like I said, they keep looking down into the valley, and that's what those cubs with their gaze is currently fixed. And just watching these even more impala that have just come out into the valley below us. I think with the sun coming out and the ground, or just the, the morning warming up, if you will, lots of different animals are starting to come out of their hiding places where they've been keeping warm for the night. And they're starting to feed on the grasslands of this, the slopes of this little valley. There's impala, there's zebra, there's wildebeest. But it's those impala that this mother cheetah is going to be most interested in. Looking in, into those herds of zebra and wildebeest, there don't seem to be any youngsters in there. So, obviously, she'll be wanting to look, she'll be wanting to, to catch something that's a manageable size for her, so something like an impala. Anything bigger, things might become quite risky for her, with her small frame. The little one grooming itself. Jackie, you say that you've got some amazing cheetah photos from this from this little scene here. I'm very glad to hear that, Jackie. I hope that they'll find a, a, a treasured spot amongst your collection of of photos. I know that we've been kind of gawking at the both the the photographs we've been able to get with our own cameras, as well as the the scene that we're bringing you now with the with the video camera. Ooh, so apparently everyone is you, everyone is saying that there's it's, it's difficult to to decide which of the two scenes is more picturesque, the backlit kind of Lion King sunrise, or now the golden light family portrait with the sky as the background. It's impossible, I tell you. <laughs> Marcel is agreeing. Also, he's saying it's impossible. He can't decide which one he likes more. Look at how those two cubs are now sitting tight next to each other. Oh, and they're staring down into the valley. They, they know it. They know that mom, well, they know that the, obviously that those animals are, are potential food for them. And although they won't yet be able to, to catch food for themselves, they'll, they'll know that, of course, that is what mom is going to hopefully try and catch for them a little bit later. And hopefully they'll then be able to fill their tummies. But we're going to stick here and see what these cheetah get up to if they do start to move if mom does start to go on the hunt we'll call you straight back in the meantime though let's go and have a look at some giraffe with barney at angola welcome back to nvo angola can anyone guess who's who those beautiful legs belong to so so far it has been 
a cold morning, quiet morning. It looks like majority of these animals are still sleeping in. Except our beautiful, lovely giraffe who is standing on the road, looking like he's enjoying the sun as it comes up. With his little helpers crawling all over his face and ears, helping him to groom and get rid of the ticks. Look at how long those eyelashes are. Ooh, that ox pecker looks like it's going straight into his ear. He's <laughs> get off me. It looks like he's enjoying that warm sun. He's been standing still in this same position for the <laughs> last while, right in the middle of the road that we're about to drive. This is what we talk about in the bush when we talk about bush traffic. Giraffes standing in the road, or an elephant for that matter, or lions lying all over the road, and you have to make a plan how to go around them. It's not the type of traffic we mind being bush lovers. It's actually quite something cool to turn around the corner, which is what keeps things exciting the whole time, that you would never know what's on the next corner again. Looking at how these guys chewing away, while we haven't seen them, Elizabeth, he, we haven't seen him pick any leaves, so we're not gonna, and I'm not sure what tree he was feeding on before, but yeah, right now it looks like he's enjoying chewing the card, which is he's regurgitating the food that he might have stored all the way up through that neck back into his mouth, and it's gonna chew for a bit, sort of back down, which kind of helps him to get as much as he can out of whatever he's taken. So Elizabeth, yeah, he looks like he's enjoying some tasty food right now. Look at that ox pecker going straight. So as this ox peckers irritate this guy that you could see on his face and he keeps on shaking them, we're gonna send you to Trishala with some buffaloes and it sounds like the ox peckers are doing exactly the same thing to the buffaloes down there. They certainly are. Some of them are getting very, very annoyed. And then the irritation has led them to be actually annoyed with each other. You can actually see it happening. When the ox pickers, they shake their heads and they don't like it. And then the next buffalo that's next to them, they're going to catch it. This is quite a large herd. So I am on the southwestern side of the reserve, just in that corner. And Steve is still looking for the lions. So it would be, I think, a good idea for those lions to come through this way. It seems like they've kind of doubled back around Central anyway. But he will give you an update. And this is quite a large herd. I haven't seen any tracks myself for the lions, though. They're also being quite noisy. A lot of infighting going on or in annoyance, rather. So they're being quite noisy. I'm getting a couple looks now. You can actually... I'm going to be quiet for a while, and you'll actually be able to hear them moving through the grass. And remember I said to you that the bush seems to be so noisy now because everything's so dry you can hear as animals pass through almost like a little shakers as the grass moves and the leaves move They all seem in really good condition. They look great. Their coats are nice and glossy.
Yes, good morning. Hi, Cindy. That's a really cool question. You'd like to know if these horns are made of the same thing that ossicones are. So ossicones are, un or when the giraffe is born, they're unfused bones that are underneath the skin. And then as the giraffe grows, those ossicon ossicones ossify, which basically means they become solid bone. But they don't have a keratin sheet over it. Horns do have bone, but they have a keratin sheath over it. And that's why we don't really, we don't call giraffe ossicones horns, because they aren't horns um, atomically. Oh, look at that. Now that's a really, really massive boss. The boss is that central bit that the males will use to fight with each other doesn't happen often. Oh, these two almost gave each other a look. Doesn't happen often where they'll they'll actually physically hit each other or, or knock horns because most of the time if animals can sort out their differences without putting their lives in danger, that's what they prefer to do because survival is number one. But when they do and those horns hit each other it's spectacular, absolutely spectacular, and you almost get a headache for the buffalo involved. Some liken it to a car hitting a brick wall at about 50 kilometers per hour. Oh, look at how, when they're curious about something, they lift up their faces and their noses point to what they're interested in. Indigo, you say they're proper helmet head. I'm going to say, I'm not going to tell them that, Indigo. Then they're going to give me the look again. And then they, they know how to keep a grudge, these guys. So I'll, I'll keep that to ourselves. They have an incredible sense of smell. And that's what that, that lifting of the nose when they see us is. Just curious, absolutely stunning. Our three cheetah haven't moved too much, everybody. They're still holding this magnificent pose for us. But what has happened since you were last with us, and I, I cannot believe it, I, Already this scene is just so magnificent, but things just got even more crazy. So while we were sitting here, remember earlier I said that I could hear some alarm calls coming from this direction. And we were just wondering what was causing those impala and those kudu to alarm call. And the area where they were alarming is at the bottom of this valley. There's quite a big riverbed with very dense vegetation. And we guess maybe there was a leopard walking through there or maybe there has been a lioness with two very small cubs in this area and we know that she has been using this riverbed as a den site for those little ones the next thing we looked down into the valley we followed the gaze we could see some wildebeest staring at something we followed the gaze of the wildebeest and the gaze of this mother cheetah and there was that lioness with her two youngsters walking across the grassland now we've asked our a tracking vehicle to go and have a look down there to see if they can catch up with her but also to see if there is signal down there um, but amazing the eyesight of this cheetah that she noticed that lioness from so far away but obviously with it being so far and with her vantage point up here obviously deciding that it's nothing to be overly concerned about and that's why she has stuck to her to her perch. I wonder if that line is maybe not just moving her youngsters to a more suitable a more suitable site, or maybe she had sometime during the night killed something and she's leading her little ones back to back to the kill. 
How crazy is that? A mother cheetah with her two cubs up on this hill and directly beneath them a lioness with her two cubs. It's been a morning full of babies, everyone. Baby rhinos, baby cheetah. But the cubs have still got their gaze fixed. Now they're actually looking at wildebeest, it looks like everybody. I don't think you guys are going to be getting wildebeest for lunch or for dinner. More than likely on Paula. Paula, you say that she looks like she's fixing to charge. Paula, she's certainly weighing up her options, I think, right now. She's looking into all those different herds that she can see, trying to decide which one is going to afford her the best cover, as well as, well, she'll obviously also be looking into those herds to see if maybe she can spot an individual that will be easier to catch than the rest. So if one impala is perhaps limping, if there's one that looks maybe a bit smaller than the, than the others, so it'll be easier for her to, to kill. Maybe there's one that looks a little bit off guard. Oh, where are you going, Mum? Look how she's now slinking, keeping her body profile low. Look at that, and the cab's following her every move. There she goes. I wonder if she's not going to come down the hill now, everyone. Looping around. She is going to go behind the vehicle, everyone, so we might lose sight of her just for a second. And then I'll try and reposition us. Look how she vanishes into the grass. Not quite leopard crawling, but just keeping herself as low as possible. Okay, we're going to have to turn around. Maybe just go to the left. Oh, she's going up the hill. Sorry, everybody, just bear with us while we turn around. There she goes up the hill. Off at a trot now. Okay, while we try and catch up with this cheetah, let's go see how Steve's lion tracking is doing. Thanks, Damon. We found the tracks of the lions. We found where they've gone all the way up and around and cut all the way down. And they moved in this direction. And the reason why is because of animals that trishala has got. This very big buffalo over here. Can you see that hoof? Okay, so some buffalo have crossed here. This is not a herd. This is a couple of dugger boys that have crossed straight over here. Some lone bulls. And uh, lions love to hunt buffalo. It is like their primary food source. I was talking yesterday about the competition that lions have over food when they have an impala and there's lots of violence, there's lots of aggression there's not much meat to go around but when they catch one of these guys life is good, life is fun and they can enjoy themselves for a couple of days. Although the last buffalo we saw the Unkumugs killed they ate it in less than 24 hours which I thought was next level amazing. So there's just Okay, so there's one here. You can tell that there's one. And he seems to be on his own. So, a poor little guy on his own is really in a bad state if he does get caught by lions because no one's to help him, no one's to protect him. But unfortunately, the tracks have crossed and it seems as if they've crossed south into Little Gowrie. So, you know, we've been using the radio to communicate with other people so as we can maximize our potential. So now what we're going to do is we're going to find you a wonderful plant which I've been wanting to detail. I'm going to show you where it grows and then we get into the depths and detail of how important it is out here from an ecological point of view as well as from some traditional uses. I hope you're all up for that. But what I think we're going to do now after all that tracking is we're going to find a nice comfortable spot to stop and have a coffee, defrost the lips, well while we're here we might as well, seeing as the trees just happens to be right here next to us. Can you see the very green one over here? This is the tree I'm going to be doing today, called the African Weeping Wattle. So here is the Weeping Wattle, known as the poor man's toilet paper. Nice and green and bushy, isn't it? So we're going to harvest one or two of these. We'll detail a few in a little while, but in the meantime, we're going to go say hello to Dylan.
Good morning everyone from a somewhat nippy Swala Kalahari this morning. Um, we had, um, it's down to about minus three at the moment. Uh, tomorrow's forecast to be a lot colder. Um, but with John Ray working his magic there, I'm sure we're going to be absolutely fine. Um, it's great having you with us. My name's Dylan. And yeah, just I hope you're going to enjoy this incredible day out here with us. Look at these gorgeous clouds that have been coming in. I know I say how cold it is, but I'm a big, big, big believer in regardless of what the weather is. Like I say, you can't change it. So let's just work with it and enjoy it, appreciate it. These clouds are moving incredibly quickly. I have no idea what the wind speeds are up there, but as I'm standing here and I'm looking up and they are absolutely scudding across the sky and they're fairly low level clouds as well. Um, but down where we are, it seems to have settled somewhat. Last night, the wind was absolutely howling. It was rattling windows and all sorts of things. So, but it seems to have settled nicely now. So I'm hoping that it's not going to be too bad but the temperature like I say is pretty nippy and and for the forecast for tomorrow is down to minus eight or minus nine real feel which um yeah maybe Jandra and I'll do a bit of ice skating tomorrow morning well I'd be on my hands and knees ice skating because I my sense of balance is not the greatest at the best of times so but um let's see what what tomorrow holds and we're going to just take a nice slow amble out to the meerkats yeah, Megan says, wow, it even looks cold. And it, it really is. It really is chilly this morning. But it's nice. It's, it's exciting. It's fun. It's good to be out. We've got old Sheldon sitting there at the water. So we, I was wondering him. He was sitting, he was sitting in the water just now. Like, but I think, yeah, well, we know these water bodies actually retain temperature a little bit. So that water won't be, or it shouldn't be as cold as, a, as your external temperature. So I think uh, Sheldon's probably batting on a good wicket there by having his when he had his little feet down inside the water there. But we're going to pop up to the meerkats and hopefully, hopefully we'll get something going on there this morning. Although I, I must say, I think these meerkats are going to be um, somewhat bleak about this weather. But let's have a look. So we've checked most of the roads up close to our boundary where we thought those lines might come back with no luck so far this morning so we have come back down almost down towards the Timbavati river again we are driving in one of the small tributaries that feeds the Timbavati to go check and see if we can find anything fresh about any sort of leopards down in the riverbed or maybe find some elephants that might be coming down grazing on this nice lush grass all over this riverbank. It is already almost 8 o'clock but it's still freezing cold down here and the animals look like they're sleeping in this morning. So as we cut this corner the sun looks like it's nice and shiny. We are coming out of a nice shady spot. Hopefully we'll drive warm for a little while as we go down and hopefully there will be some things that are maybe basking along the rocks in the riverbed that we might get to see. And that's what we're doing for most of this morning. So sometimes early in the morning when things are nice and cool, majority of things are up and about. But this is not one of those mornings so far from what we can tell. It looks like it's one of those where everything is getting cold and everybody is keeping warm and staying wherever they are without too much movement. It is a beautiful morning indeed and as you see the sun's coming up it's starting to warm up slightly so we're hoping that we're getting warm so as the animals wherever they are that maybe they're gonna start coming out for us and at least have a little bit of a view but we'll see how that goes So as we drive along this riverbed, we'll send you carry on and send you over to Steve and give you so we can get an update from his side. Well, we found a roadblock, everybody. Very exciting, though. A nice pile of poo. 
Now, I don't know if any of you know me very well, but I like to talk about poo and who dung that. Now, let's quickly ask all of you out there, who dung this? Send a quick answer on the YouTube chat stream or on Twitter if you know who dung this. Um, the only way sometimes to know is to go and investigate, and it's very hard for you to see where you are. But there's a track over here, and there's a track two over here. Okay, so important when looking at scat or dung or poo, measure it. Okay, so if we measure the size of that poo there, that takes us to about eight centimeters. Okay, now I don't know who, I, I, I do know who did it because I can see the track here. There's, a, there's four toes here and a beautiful little back pad. So you know what to touch with your fingers. So let's just try to break it open a little bit. Try to see what the consistency is inside. Asthma, no, it's not wild dog, but you're not far off when you say dog. But uh, there's some fur. There's even some green in there. So now it might not even have been the animal who did it. Jody K reckons hyena. Now Jody K, it's definitely not a hyena. Hyena's got very a very big bottom. The track over here is the track of a small dog. Um, but it's also possible that the small dog just came along and smelt this because I'm not seeing any bone. I'm kind of seeing a little bit of, there is some fur in there, but it looks like it's mainly vegetation, which is very strange, to be honest with you. Jamie S, no, not a civet. A civet has got a, a very large sphincter, and they give rise to very large poo, and they generally do it in what we call a midden. So first of all, we've identified a track over here that I've identified as a jackal, Sherry, well, I was thinking it was a jackal, but I've had some doubts. Um, the track tells me jackal. The track there and there is a jackal. But a jackal like to often defecate on top of other animals' poo. They don't waste a good poo. They'll put their poo on top of someone else's poo. An elephant, a rhino, civet even, sometimes even lion. They'll go on top. Adds a bit of volume, a bit of sort of weight to it, I suppose. But this jackal might just have smelt this. I don't know if I'm going to smell it. I think I'm going to smell it. Doesn't smell bad. I am pretty sure jackal poo would smell atrocious. Greg wants me to taste it. No, he's saying please don't taste it. Now there's some white hairs in there. I really don't know. I'm going to have to look in my scatalog. But it looks like it's mainly vegetation. I'm perplexed. Some fur. It doesn't look like a dog poo. There's no bone, there's no meat, it's all vegetation. Very strange. Well, every now and again, everybody, you don't know who dung it. I've taken some photos, so I'm going to investigate. I'll post it on, on social media. The track is a jackal. The poo could be, but I don't think so. It is very controversial Tuesday today. But anyway, that's the one thing about nature, everybody, is you don't always know. You don't always know. You can have a look and try and think as much as you want to. I'll pull out my scatalog book there in a moment and have a look as well. But everything looking inside moves away from jackal. But the tracks is jackal. They are regarded as being quite omnivorous. So stand up and dust ourselves off and send you over to Chishala. I wonder if she's still with her buffaloes. Not sure how I feel about that link. <laughs> Controversial, yes. Slightly furry, maybe. <laughs> anyway, guys, I have just gone past Treehouse Dam to just have a quick look. Maybe we'd be lucky with some tracks or Ellie's there, but nothing. So I'm going to swing around and check out the den. I haven't seen a Corky's very tiny bundle of joy just yet, so I'd love to be able to see that little cub. I did go through yesterday afternoon, but it was inactive. 
so we'll have a look now. It's nice and warm as well at the moment. It was much more chilly in the morning, so I think that if the cubs are going to be out, or if it is active, this would be a good time. I am astounded by the lack of leopard tracks. I haven't seen one track since my return yesterday. Not one, not even an old one. Exactly. I feel like I need my leopard fix. But you know these things, they, they come and go and or rather our frequency of seeing them. And so hopefully we will, we will catch a break very, very soon. Well, we don't have any leopard spots, but we do have some cheetah spots. So let's go and see. So this mother cheetah, everybody, has been giving us the absolute runaround. You cannot believe how much ground she has covered since you saw us last. We had a hell of a time trying to keep up with her, and then we lost her, and we thought, oh, and then she lies down. We thought, how, how could we lose a cheetah in this? Even though the grass is long, it was a, an area that we should have been able to find her pretty easily, and then we realized that she wasn't where we thought she was. She was about... 400 meters away from where we'd last seen her. Now I know that it's not the greatest view for the time being. You might just be able to see her head sticking out of the long grass there. So I'm thinking that it might be those, remember she, we said that you could see that lioness, and it might be that she decided it was too much of a risk to keep her little ones up on that hillside, and she has now moved them away. She ran straight past a big herd of impala, so it's obvious that Whatever caused her to move wasn't food related, it was, it was obviously a, a safety concern for her and her youngsters. She's now settled down in that long grass again. And unfortunately, it has taken her, 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 her big move has taken her away from the area that most of the herds of impala in this part of of Pinda kind of have been congregating in the last few weeks just because of the food availability. So it might mean that finding a meal for herself and her youngsters today is going to be a bit tougher with that lioness being where she is, but it's not a compromise. I don't think it's, yeah, I don't think that there's a compromise to be had there. She needs to obviously put her safety and her cub safety first. But that being said, there will be other opportunities a little bit away from from this area she goes and moves around a couple of the water holes there might be the odd impala ram there maybe a stienbok or a daker in some of the thicker areas but my goodness me the way that she moved everybody she absolutely she covered serious ground you saw how she was slinking low to the ground trying to keep her herself as inconspicuous as possible both to the lioness but also to the surrounding prey species like the zebra and the impala shidulufan you're asking how old these particular cubs are shidulufan they're probably about four months old um so yeah they've started to lose the the fluff on the back of their necks or at least along their backs um, so yeah, about four months old. And of course at this age they'll be feeding on meat and reliant on mom to, to catch prey for them. And certainly oh, the two mother cheetah that we've been following, um, well more closely at least in the past few weeks, have provided us with some absolutely amazing um, kind of hunt, hunts over the last few, over the last few weeks. And just because of that added nutritional demand on them, having to feed their cubs, often mother cheetah will, or cheetah will have to hunt a bit more often when they've got, when they've got little ones to feed. 
we've noticed that with this particular this particular female cheetah in the last in the last few weeks that she when we've actually seen her with a carcass we've noticed that she hasn't actually had much to eat and I don't know if it's maybe because of the amount of wind that we've had we've noticed that they've been quite nervous or particularly more nervous than usual around carcasses and that she hasn't been been filling up as much as she normally would so shame a lot of a lot of things going against this mother cheetah and her little ones lions in the area wind making her nervous just see her head now sticking out of out of that long green grass and she's still looking back in the direction of where those lion where that lioness was but like I said not not the end of the world for her just yet in terms of, of finding some food this morning and I think that as the morning goes on she's probably gonna get more and more active in terms of looking for food she'll know that the later on the, in the day that it gets um, the better her chance or the less her chance of encount of having an encounter with a lion or a leopard um, that will be more nocturnal so I think if we just spend a bit more time with her and we're patient we might get rewarded so that's exactly what we're gonna do in the meantime though let's go get an update from Mike with his elephants Hi, so we have been, we left those elephants, they were still feeding, and we've headed down towards the leopard dam and we found tracks of a leopard. Now I just want to listen for a moment because it's an alarm call happening in that direction behind me. Just listen. Hear that? That sounds like an alarm call from Impalas, and the leopard tracks were on this road. I can't see them now, but I want to just keep moving in that direction. It might be that this leopard is either marking her territory, or maybe hunting, or something. It's very bright, I don't think she's hunting. But let's keep moving and just see if those tracks come back on the road, and we know we're on the right, uh, right direction. Well, it's always good to follow up on alarm calls of animals, because it means that we're going to uh, hopefully find something at the end of that... Uh, of that search. It's always tricky with leopards, especially here at Pride Lands, they haven't had a lot of exposure to vehicles. So they are still quite nervous around the vehicle, so we've got to keep our distance and, and slowly build their confidence in us. It's quite difficult you looking around here in this golden grass for that movement. You know, you're looking for a flick of a tail or a, the head popping up or anything. She's most likely walking down in this drainage line next to us because that's where she would do her best hunting, from down there where she can't be seen. Just popping her head up to look for any, uh, any prey, or listen for any prey, and then going back into the drainage line as she moves along. She was walking along the road, which makes me think that she's probably just patrolling her territory. Now, female leopards, if it is a female, tracks looked quite small. Female leopards are territorial, as well as the males. They'll only be defending it from members of the same sex, though, so she'll only really chase away other female leopards if she finds. So, there are some questions about whether there could be... Alarm. I'm going to stop here again just to listen, whether something else could be causing the alarm. Only a predator, really, would cause the impalas to alarm call like that. An elephant moving through would probably, they might run away from the elephant, but there wouldn't alarm call. That alarm call is really specifically, you can still hear them here. It's, it's quite close to us now, the alarm calling. Okay, I'm going to keep moving uh, slowly forward. So yes, an, an elephant would cause the animals to be afraid and run off but they wouldn't necessarily start alarm calling. Hyenas, maybe. Lions, definitely. Uh, the the wood alarm would cause the impalas to alarm call. But not, there's the impalas. They're looking that way, to our right. 
So we're going to stop again and just make sure where they're looking. And we'll keep our search going. Hey guys, so I've just come past the den and it is not active at the moment, but there are tracks all around. So they're still using it. It's just not currently very active. There it is. This is not the entrance they use. The one is on this side. But of course, there's nobody around, so we're going to scoot right past. Now, while I'm here, I'd like to just give you an update on what's going on with Swazi. We are actively trying to find him and work with the Sabi Sands to make sure that he is free from the snare slash wire that's been on his neck. I haven't seen it yet, so I can't really tell you what I think it is, but I have seen the photos of it. And it is not something that that we want to prolong, you know. We want to get that sorted as soon as possible. In fact, we will be assisting um, the Sabi Sands in going out and having a look for him even after this drive. And then the vets will be called in and we'll get it sorted out as soon as possible. Now he has to, obviously, be darted in order for that to come off. And we have to do that during the day. Because there's a problem if he has to be darted in the evening, then not just is it a difficult work for the vet, because then you have to find him, because you don't just dart him and he falls and uh, suddenly asleep. He'll still walk for a little bit, so you'll have to find him. And what if something else finds him before we do? So we have to make sure that we do it in the day and we do it as soon as possible. And that's what we're going to work towards. And we're going to do that, obviously, in conjunction with the Sami Sands and with the best interests of Swazi. Michelle and a lot of you are saying thank you for the update. My absolute pleasure. It was um, when I first heard that that he had this around his neck. I was a little bit upset. Um, because you know you get to know these animals, we all get to know these animals. And um, there's a certain attachment that's formed, even though we know this is the wild, etc. So we will really, really be doing our best. And I will give you an update as soon as I can and whenever I can. I'm just driving through the block to see if whether he or any of the other hyenas are sitting up somewhere because they, if they're not at the den, sometimes they just move away from the den and they sit around. I think that has a lot to do with whether the cubs are bothering them or a bit too full of energy because they'll come out generally when the adults are around. So if the adults start to disperse a little bit further and the cubs can't see or smell them, then they can have a bit of a rest. you saying that you're sure that the hyena cubs are tucked up all safe in the den? They are. Especially Corky's little ones. The other two are getting quite adventurous, which I love to see. Love, love to see that. But they too will still be very cautious and still have that instinct to survive. Oh! I wonder if you could see them just through there. Green wood hoopoos shouting for us. Gorgeous. All right. 
On that note, let me send you over to Swallow and Dylan. See what they're getting up to this morning. So we've just got down to the Meerkat burrows here, but look how gorgeous the setting is with that light along the hills, these clouds scudding in here. It is just absolutely unbelievably beautiful this morning. The cold notwithstanding, it's just stunning, 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 stunning. So there's been some interesting developments of the meerkats. They're not out yet, no surprises. Um, but Veronique, the lady that's working on the habituation, she says there was actually two other meerkats that arrived here yesterday. Um, one super relaxed, very habituated, so it could have been a, a breakaway from the Hossa group. Um, and then there was one that was super skittish, we don't know at all. So anyway, it'll be interesting to see what transpires over the course of the day. Um, but while we're at it, I just wanted to show you something over here. So this little digging over here, Actually, I wanted to show it to you yesterday, and then for various reasons we, we didn't, but this is actually uh, a hole that a meerkat has dug. And if, Jean, I don't know if you can see ins right inside here, you can see the claw marks all along the inside of it. There. See that? So, and the big, quite a big pile of sand here. So when you get a, a digging like this from a meerkat, I mean, its entire body would have been inside there. This is almost certainly for a very, very high value food item, probably something like a scorpion. Yeah, you get these beautiful big burrowing scorpions, or when I, I'm doing this like, like a fisherman story, a beautiful big burrowing scorpion, it was at least the size, no, they, the, the big bodied ones will be about that length. Um, so with a tail, you'd be looking kind of like that. Um, but still, for a, for a meerkat to get a food item like that, this is the kind of digging that, that, that they would do. So when you see these kind of things, then you know that they're onto something very, very good. Um, but yeah, so you can see the meerkats, or the meerkat burrows have been heavily utilized during the course of yesterday afternoon. Laura, Laura Moore has said again, she still doesn't understand how the burrows don't collapse. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a very quick demo here as an example. Okay, so on the surface here, you can see how soft the sand is. Okay, so you dig that, it's just gonna keep falling in. Okay, but watch this. Just bear with me a second. Okay, so there's all that soft sand that's gone. Okay, suddenly, you're on much harder ground. Look there much harder ground. So then you can actually start digging into there and you see how it actually holds its form and shape. So, and the deeper down you go, the more compact the sand is. So you can actually get these burrows. So don't worry too much about the soft, soft surface. This is really, it's, this is just the stuff that's been churned up by wind and animal tracks and that, uh, and you know, animals walking. But this harder stuff inside there, you can actually actually dig a hole. I think we can dig a hole and try bury Jandre later if you want. But we'll dig him up again, don't worry. <laughs> but there, there you can see, that's a really nice example of how the burrows can actually maintain their form very, very easily in these kind of substrates. So, cool. We've managed to get a slightly better view of this mother cheetah. Her little ones are lying just around her legs in that long grass, trying to shelter from the wind. And just talking about that long grass, we were actually just thinking now, remember earlier this morning how we lost that baby rhino in this long grass? Just imagine for those little cheetah cubs, how difficult it must be to keep up with their mother in this long grass when she moves so quickly and when they're so small and of course mom's body look at how well it blends into that long grass it must be very tough for them to keep up with her and to keep track of her now that she's turned away from us have a look at the backs of her ears everyone can you see how dark they are and how they contrast quite starkly against the rest of her body and of course, as she slinks, she 
She's got her ears kind of turned out to the sides and facing backward a little bit. And those very kind of prominent black spots will make things a little bit easier for those cubs to follow their mother through the long grass. Also, of course, mum's black and white tail giving them a bit of a guiding kind of beacon to follow through this long grass. And then if all of that doesn't doesn't quite manage to, or if, if they don't quite manage to find her after all of that, remember last time we heard her making that contact call to call her little ones? Thankfully she didn't have to do that today. The cubs are able to keep up with her and stick with her. But we've now seen it a few times where in this very heavy wind where the cubs have gotten a bit lost from their mother while she moves and they've had to rely on on those contact calls to find each other after mom does a big maneuver like she just did kenny you're saying that they're just such stunning cats kenny i very much agree with you they're just so elegant and sleek those colors on them are just magnificent but for me it's that elegance it's that very big very big kind of full chest it houses those big lungs that help to or help them to take in enough oxygen to run at the speed that they do that very sleek body and the muscular back allows them to run at the speed that they do but look at this mother now, see how her ears have started to droop to the sides and even looks like her head is hanging a little bit. She's still facing in the direction of where she moved from, so the direction where she saw that lioness. Still keeping a watchful eye in that direction. And I think that we might be in for a bit of a wait this morning everybody. But like I said, the later it gets, the more I reckon our chances, or the better our chances will get of watching her get up and start to move around. Often when it's, when it's, oh, often w w with the mother cheetah and her youngsters, if they go to, to sleep, or if they go to rest at night, and there are predators nearby, and mom does manage to smell the presence of a lion or a hyena they will often will sleep quite restlessly even if it's just windy like this and mom has got to keep a, a watchful eye out the whole time and so often they won't sleep too well in the night and they'll take the opportunity first thing in the morning when the sun is up to rest a bit more uh, before continuing with their day and I think that's part of what's going on now butterfly you said this mother cheetah looks like she's in perfect shape she does look in very good nick have a look at her coat it's very little very few blemishes on it and although she does look like she's hungry she's not skinny her coat looks in good condition hasn't got too many scars on her although we wouldn't expect a, a female cheetah to have many scars on her body but while we wait for our mother cheetah to get up and and move around a little bit or wait for her to like we said hopefully start to hunt a little bit later apparently steve is in the grass as well so let's go see what he's up to well i have indeed now we wanted to talk about the tree the feltiforum africanum a wonderful wonderful shade tree i mean look how well camouflaged i am in here this is a tree that for the most part has leaves all year round. Now, we found in the summer months, leopards, lions, many, many animals like to sleep underneath this tree. I mean, we're in the dead of winter. We're nearly approaching the end of winter. And already, look at this tree. It's still covered in leaves. So it's a magnificent shade tree. It's a magnificent habitat tree. You might find many, many birds nesting in them. Plenty of organic material falling on the floor. These leaves drop huge amounts of leaf material onto the ground and the shade that's given here makes a very nice ecological niche which means that trees that don't like too much sun they like a little bit more shade they like it a bit cooler or grasses as well will be able to sort of sustain themselves underneath here a wonderful tree isn't it and they never generally grow too straight 
they get influenced and pushed over and affected by elephants. Elephants like to feed on the bark. You don't really see them feeding too much on the leaves. It's very bitter. It's really not very nice. Not very nice at all. So what we're going to do is I've harvested, ugh, I've harvested some. We're going to go to Treehouse Dam. We're going to break it down for you. We're going to make some decoctions, some teas. We're going to talk about the medicinal value of this plant. Ecologically, really, really nice plant for, for the environment with regards to shade. Um, it accesses water. Um, some animals, I've had Hosanna up these trees, a male leopard who's actually hoisted trees, uh, kills up this tree. And, and on that, someone reminded me that two years ago today, I found Hosanna again after he disappeared. That was a find. That was a wonderful, wonderful find. But a wonderful tree. White, white lady, Eon reminded us of that. So thank you very much. Okay, so I've got some on the tree over there. Now, what I want you to talk about as well is sustainability and harvesting of plants. Now, I've harvested one. You can see that there's plenty of this tree. There's lots of these trees around. The most sustainable part of a plant to harvest is the flowers and the fruit and possibly the leaves. <clears throat> lots and lots of leaves. Secondly, or should I say thirdly, bark. You need to harvest sustainably. Remember bark, what's the purpose of bark? Bark is to protect the plant against fire, uh, dehydration, water loss, and insect attack. Now, if you damage bark of a tree, you in invite those things to happen to them. We can do it sustainably, we can be careful, but roots are where a lot of plants have them at as a value, and harvesting roots is not the most sustainable practice in the world. So I often don't do it. I often will find a tree and elephants pushed over and harvest roots off of that so that we can keep things sustainable because that's one of the biggest things we have in the social ecological systems these days is the unsustainable harvesting of medicinal plants from the wild. Um, it's bad education, uh, low income, the need to understand that ecologically we need to keep these um, plants around for a long time. I'm sorry about my game drive radio that's just shouting at you over there. So sustainable practices are very, very important. We live in a paradigm now where conservation around the world is known as social ecological systems, which basically means we need to manage the environment with people living in it. So we need to come up with strategies. How can people live off the land? We, people need to live off the land so let's help them live off the land but let's teach them how to harvest the vegetation sustainably so that they can use it next year and the following year and their grandchildren can use it because otherwise what's going to happen i'm going to decide i want to do all of it now um, the tragedy of the commons a very common saying where which means the common place where the common resources are the tragedy of the commons means that people just use everything as quickly as they can before anyone else can use it and unfortunately that mindset is not sustainable so sustainable agriculture sustainable plant growing people should grow plants and if we're going to harvest from the wild we need to do so so that that tree can survive and unfortunately roots is the quickest way to kill a plant so we need to be very careful about doing that okay well we're going to be settling up at Treehouse setting up a medicinal for you and we're going to send you over to Anbion Gala. Welcome back to Anbion Gala. As indicated earlier we came down close to the riverbed to look for some fresh leopard tracks. We nicely found fresh tracks and with uh, the help of the tracking team we managed to locate the Shitsalala leap again. What you see now on the screen, it is the young Shitsalala male. The mother has done a great job overnight. She managed to kill them an impala female and that she nicely put up in the tree for safety. They have eaten most of it. Of course, it's three leopards, so they ate at least 60 to 70 percent. That is only the head, neck, and a little bit of a chest left. You can see it's on the transvaal saffron. Great thing that she's put it up a tree because the density of hyenas in this place is intense. And if it was on the ground, almost guaranteed that they would have lost it overnight. Right now, since we've been here, we have not seen a hyena ourselves, but there have been a lot of hyena tracks all over around this area. Of course, 
the leopards do what leopards do best see how they she's not nicely tuck himself in into that thick bush he is in the shady spot but also he went in there to hide away when the trekkers were on foot spotted him going there and he's staying there for the time being but hopefully he's gonna come out soon so the sister and the mother are most likely to be down into the riverbed itself we haven't seen a lot of the a lot of them as yet but I'm sure they are in this area as well. They could also be hiding just below towards where he is. But we're just going to patiently sit here. It will be nice to actually wait a little bit with them. Get to see them out and about and in action to go maybe climb a tree and feed for us. So of course, like we said, it was so cold. If it wasn't, it is swarming up slightly, but it's not hot yet. So if it wasn't for the fact that he saw the trekkers and go hide in that thick bush, hoping that his camouflage is going to save him from being spotted, he will most likely be still lying right in the open, enjoying the nice warm sun. And as he relaxes and forgets about what he saw earlier on now with a vehicle, which is something that he's used to, hopefully they're slowly but surely going to start coming out. Yeah. Peter, yes, yeah, she's got two cubs, a young male and a young female. And of course, at the age that they are on, the young male is already almost the mother's size, if not slightly bigger. The female is just slightly below shoulder height on the mother's side, so they are quite big leopards already. So one impala is not going to last them too long. I'm sure they will be done latest by this evening in this area. And then the mother will take them somewhere else. If there were still tiny cubs, after a great job that she's done, a fully grown impala female like in a tree like that, she could be able to feed on that for a good two or three days. But right now, because they also take as much as she does at the moment, so in the parlor, it's still a big enough to fill them up for good two days, but doesn't go as far as it would if they were much, much younger than they are right now. So, yeah, we're gonna stick, I'm going to stick around here, just see what else happens. I might try and see if I can find another better spot and see what happens. One meerkat that's up there now, um, and then about five minutes ago. Keep them up. It's just the other one that's left over now. Not. <laughs> no. This little guy's been popping in and out, in and out, in and out, just checking this wind, checking this weather. But they're actually quite sheltered where the burrow is. To Jandro's left hand side, there's a a clump of bush, I mean it's not very dense, but it actually provides a little bit of wind, this w uh, shelter from the wind. The wind is pushing out the south. There we go, you can see that. So that clump of bush provides a little bit of shelter from that cold south wind. So it's actually not that bad where they're sitting. And it's, it's really settled nicely compared to what it was like last night and early this morning. So um, although the ambient temperature is very cold this morning, it's actually not so bad as long as the wind has dropped and you're out of the and you're in the sun and you're out of the wind then it's actually not so bad at all and i'm just really pleased that um you know this is one of the nice relaxed ones there's absolutely no sign um veronique said they actually chased them down now genre i don't know if you can see that big tree way in the distance there that very very big tree we'll have a look at it just now but Apparently this group of meerkats chased those other two intruding meerkats way down the bottom there. You can see that huge tree in the distance. That's about 400 meters, 500 meters from us. And they chased them way other side of that. And then they came back to the burrow. So, especially now when they've got these little pups, they're not going to tolerate any kind of intruders into the area. And that's obviously crucial for the pup survival. I mean, there's no ways... The elf is going to risk any kind of me other meerkats coming in that there, there might be any impact on her, on the survival of her pups. 
We can see over the horizon there how these clouds are still pushing in. It's a, it's a huge cold front. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more of this over the course of the day. Of course, if these clouds do move out completely with this cold ambient temperature, it's just going to, any heat that's built up will just dissipate very, very quickly. So as said that that's quite a distance to chase those strange meerkats away. That they will do that double that distance if they have to. If she thinks there's a, a very real threat to the group or the colony, these meerkats will chase other meerkats even further than that. But obviously what they'll do, they'll they'll push them up to the, the edge of their territory into a neighboring territory and then they'll leave them because obviously they're not going to risk going right deep into the heart of of a, another colony of meerkats um, or the territory of another colony of meerkats. Um, so there's kind of like different parameters there. And also remember that their burrows are not necessarily central within their territory. So you could, they could be using a burrow that's already on the existing edge of their territory or close to the edge. And then if an intruder comes from there, oh, they might only chase it 100 meters to move it away from the area. Um, but normally, you know, if it's a, it's a burrow located close to the middle of the area, then they chase it quite a long, long distance. Yeah, the others aren't, aren't getting out of bed just yet. But I think, they, I think it shouldn't be too long. I mean, like I said, you know, the clouds keep obscuring the sun. You know, you can see the, the, the shadow coming over us. And the light just really dims and then it gets brighter again. So we've got these clouds that keep on passing. But it's, they, they are quite patchy, though. So, yeah, I think let's just give it some time before these other ones come out. I think it'll be probably another couple of minutes yet. So, <clears throat> it's quite a difficult view to get to see the other one, the young female. She's almost down in the drainage line. Uh, but because of the nice thick Kubu bear is right in the river's bank. It's not easy to see. But what we've noticed, they are quite close to each other now. But what we've started noticing in the last few days is that the mother is already starting to encourage these two about the solitary life that they're going to face going ahead. How she has now started leaving them, unless there's a carcass, of course. How she started leaving them in separate places. So we, yesterday when she was found, she was only found with the young female cub and she was on the move and it looks like they were, they were coming on this direction to come possibly find this young maid over here. And that is her training them for, to get better at being what leopards do best, which is being solitary and don't interact with too many other things so long. So when they're very young, they interact a lot, but at this age, they're being playful part of the two of them, even when they are in the same place, is slowly but surely being cut off because that's what the mother is encouraging, trying to make them realize that they're not going to have each other, each other for life. Let's just see some spot. Got a comment on that camouflage. That is possibly one of the best camouflages there is to get. We are sitting literally 10 meters, 15 meters away from these leopards, but we can hardly see them. But we're hoping that they are going to digest for whatever they've eaten the most of that impala. And hopefully they gonna one of them will go up, move towards the tree to go start feeding. Which, in which case that might even start a little bit of problem between the two because leopards, as much as it's a mother and two cubs, you don't often see them feeding together on the same carcass at the same time. They often just take turns. And as to the two siblings, that's often starts a little bit of siblings rival where one wants to feed before the other one and vice versa. So with a lot of that, it will be interesting while we await here to see how this whole thing is going to unfold.
Brotherin Olle. Oh, he's moving a little bit. Looks like he's just repositioning himself. Keeping an eye on us big time. Looks like there are some flies that are bothering, bothering him, looking at how much twitching is that ear doing. That might be something that's going to drive him crazy. It's going to make him want to get out of there, which will be cool if it happens. Because it means that he might come out into a complete open, or it could be the complete opposite, where he's going to go more into a dense vegetation, where we might not see him anymore. I don't know if you can hear, of course we are along the drainage line with some big, big trees around. There is a sound of one of the biggest eagles that, you know, owls that we have here called the Veru Eagle Owl calling on a distance away. Let's stick with these leopards a little bit more. We'll send you to Trish for a quick update and then see what they do and we'll keep you updated. Update! Not much to update on. What I am going to do is swing past Galigo Pan and then up around the northern side of Viatella Dam and then going to swing past the den again. Just in case, I mean, hyenas move in such a kind of random fashion that you wouldn't be able to, firstly, it's very difficult to track them. I'd say probably one of the most difficult animals to track. Um, and so even though we didn't see them just now when we visited, they could have easily come round again. So I think I will do that. Sometimes Swazi likes to sit behind camp, which is basically where Galago Pan is. So that's why I'm doing this loop. I also saw lots and lots of fresh elephant dung, as well as elephant tracks, but no elephants. And then I thought I heard them and I was like, yes, elephants. And then I approached it, it was the buffalo herd. So I'd love to see an Ellie. Hi Bernice, you'd like to know if I've heard anything about Tingana since I've been back, especially since we were chatting about the leopard tracks and how I haven't seen much. I haven't heard anything about Tingana. Um, my last stint that I was here, which was about four weeks ago, or at least when I saw Tingana, was about four weeks ago, and he was by, he was actually right here at Galigo Pan, and we found him in the evening, BK and I. And he was scent marking, he looked really good, he was in excellent, excellent condition. So even though we're seeing less of him, I don't think that he's not. Uh, not territorial. Maybe he's just moving to a just different part of his ter territory. Most likely northwards. I will tell you that I did see, oh sorry, I did hear that there were there were male leopard tracks heading out at Gallego Shortcut, the road we just came off to the north. And though it's difficult to make assumptions about which leopard is, which male leopard is making that track at the moment. I suspect it may have been Tinganus. Maybe we'll see him soon. Wild Earth relies on support from viewers like you to carry on broadcasting our daily live shows. A small donation goes a long way in helping us on our mission to connect the world with nature. Please visit our support page to see how you can help and become part of the Wild Earth family. 
Thanks, Trish. Well, we're just sticking around as well. We're here sitting on the ground. I'm busy harvesting some, uh, some bark from the tree I spoke to about, and at the same time, trying to also reveal the wonderful yellow wood that is produced by this lovely tree. I told you before, the African weeping wattle, Feltiforum africanum. And we'll deal, delve into it a little bit more. Just get some bark here. The reason why I want to harvest some bark for you quickly is because I'm going to do something known as a decoction. And a, a lot of people hear the word concoction and they always say, what concoction you're going to make? Now, a concoction is a mixture of a couple of things. Uh, whereas a decoction uh, is when you take, what I'm going to do now, a whole lot of bark or leaves or roots. And you can see it here. It's still very fresh and very green. Uh, probably would work to keep this for a day at least or two days or three days let it dry out a bit and then use it but we're going to use it in the moment and a decoction is you take water and you bring it to the boil like my little kettle over here boiling away and I'm going to throw two parts water to one part bark plus minus the ratio right here is not exact it's not exact science but I'm going to pour that in there and uh, a decoction is going to be me allowing this brew over here to boil for eight to ten minutes. Just like boiling potatoes, have you ever tried to eat a potato raw? First of all, it could probably kill you. Second of all, it's really not very nice and um, it's not soft. So what the decoction does is it activates and brings out the plant ingredients that are inside the bark. Now, normally I'll use roots as well if I can get hold of roots. Uh, trees and plants they have lots and lots of nutrient value in the bark and the roots it's places where they store those nutrients uh, against fire and against herbivory but obviously elephants know this and elephants push trees over a feed on the bark not because it tastes good maybe it does i haven't tasted bark yet that tastes really nice excuse me but because the value is there and uh, humans have used and learned that as well. We can pull trees over, push trees over, dig up bulbs, dig up tubers. Look at the foods we eat these days. And what do we do with a lot of it? We boil it. We cook it to get that active ingredient out into the soup, into the stew, whatever it might be. So that is what a decoction is. It's taking the active ingredient, boiling it for 8 to 10 minutes so that the water can take out all that liquid. Then you can either throw away... The, the bark ingredient and drink the liquid or the bark ingredient can be applied to whatever it might be. Um, so we've also got some bark over here, natural raw bark, which apparently you can chew if you want to. I mean, here it is. You can see it's quite nice there. Um, it actually be, can be chewed as a diuretic. Now, a diuretic is something that makes you sweat. Have you ever had cold and fever and you, you take certain uh, medicine that makes you start to sweat? Like for example, chili or cayenne pepper. If I'm ever feeling ill, I'll take a little bit of hot water and a huge amount of cayenne pepper and stir it in there and drink it. What do I do? My whole body starts to sweat. So diaphoretics actually help you to sweat out whatever illness there might be. Um, Emma, can you go again with the name? I didn't get that person's name. They're wondering about poisonous plants. Now there are a fair few poisonous plants around. Uh, the euphorbias. Krishna, Krishna, you want to know poisonous plants. There are a fair few plants around, namely the Tamburti and the Euphorbias. So Tamburti falls under the Euphorbia family, and those are very, very, very toxic. So generally a hard and fast rule is you can go and take something, and if it's got milky latex, rather stay away from it. But what you can also do is um, you can take something like this, and you can take it on your skin. You rub it on your skin, on a a rough part of your skin, like maybe in the top of your arm, the top of your hand. And if it doesn't cause any blisters or sores or welts, then you can take it onto a much softer part of your hand. And then you can, if it doesn't cause anything as well, then you can go to the next stage, which is, if it's bitter, avoid it. Bitterness is generally something you should avoid eating. And if it's not bitter, then you can maybe eat a little bit at a time little bit at a time if you see monkeys eating something it's possible you'll be able to eat it as well don't think you can go eat things that other animals have are eating but monkeys we can digest similar stuff but you'd have to take it in small quantities otherwise you probably get a very irritable bowel okay while we're waiting for this to develop um, the leaf structure this is the we weeping wattle 
Let me just very, very nice. You can come right in up on the leaf structure there. So it's very messy accumulation of leaves at the end of the branch, known as a compound leaf. Many, many, many leaves there. It's very, very green. It's very soft, very, very soft. It's also why people call it poor man's toilet paper. If you do happen to find yourself in the bush and you need to wipe the nether regions, this can work quite well, but it does sometimes leave little bits. So <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's not regarded as very wealthy toilet paper, but it's very soft and very delicate and pulling a branch off like this works very well for keeping flies away from you as well. So that's a very, very nice way because I mean, even the, the lion, the king of the jungle battles with flies. That is a wonderful African proverb. But we're going to go through this. We're going to let our decoction boil. We're going to figure out our medicinal properties. We'll come back and talk about some of the wood as well and what we can do with the wood and what exactly it is the elephant is getting out of this plant and hopefully some benefits for ourselves as well. But you'll come back to us in a moment. So it sounds like Steve is making some hot concoction that side. I think you should try send some over um, to Swalu because we can make some good use of it as well as for the meerkats. It's still just a single animal that's been up and down, going down, coming out, going down, coming out. Um, yeah, these temperatures are really not ideal for the meerkats. And I'm just hoping that those pups are all still fine downstairs. I'm sure they'll be, yes, it must be so, so toasty and warm underground over there and most of these burrow entrances over here um, are actually not facing into the wind so you've got this breeze that's now again picking up remember i said it had settled it had died down nicely it's actually picking up again the clouds are becoming denser i don't think we're going to be seeing too much more sun this morning um, but that being said i think yeah, these mere, the, these meerkat pups are going to be absolutely fine downstairs there's that, that's the little alpha there sitting right in front of Jandre now. Ooh, shame. The, the, she's the one that's going to be feeling the, feeling the, <laughs> feeling the heat, so to speak. No. So Ruth has asked, are the claws on a meerkat's back feet as long as the ones on the front feet? Uh, no, they're not. Jandre, I don't know if you're even able to see the the claws on the on the hind feet over there okay no no you, you can't from where he is um but the claws on the hind feet are a lot shorter um and the reason for that is simply that they don't use the hind claws for actually digging it's the forepaws <laughs> the forepaws the front claws or the the claws on the front feet that they use for the digging so those are the ones that they need those long um long nails on so yeah she's just got her feet tucked away in the sand over there but, um, and she, the re she actually moved there specifically to get out the wind. So that's just really nice to see that behavior where she actually moved from the burrow that she was sitting at. And remember I said the wind is picking up now. This breeze is freshening properly. Um, it's probably sitting at about 20 kilometers an hour now, now, maybe slightly less, but certainly picking up. And she actually moved from where she was into that position to get out of that wind. Yeah, we <laughs> looks like he said this up. Something has caught his attention. He keeps looking behind him, but does the get up the direction of where the carcass is? So this is good news. He's sitting up and he's looking right there. It looks like he might just have thought about getting up and heading there to go for another feast. He's such full bellied, but with the amount of time he lied down. He didn't do much, he must have digested slightly, get a little bit of space open. He just moved out of, of the picture. I don't know if he's lying down. Sounds like he's coming straight towards us right now, which is exciting. It 
just gone behind the bush. It looks like it might have even be going for a quick bathroom break. Maybe to want to open a little bit more space before it goes back. Yeah, it's happening. After of all of this movement, chances are, if he doesn't come down and lie in this nice soft sand in the riverbed, that he might head back towards the tree itself for another little bit of a feast there. Look at how long his tail is. Hello. He just gave Owen some personal look right there. Yeah. At least he's decent. He moved away a little bit from the sister. It does look like he's trying to find a comfortable spot for his little bit of a bathroom break. He's grown so fast, he's such a big leopard. He's gonna be big. He's gonna be so big, he's possibly gonna be bigger than his father, who is not a small leopard. got such a perfect face, no scars whatsoever. It's sad to imagine that later on in life when he grows up, of course he's going to have to be kicked out of this area to go start his own territory. That he's going to have to fight and maybe one day we'll see him as a dominant male with a lot of scars. So we're going to just watch him move around and see if he takes us back to the tree to go for his feast after his bathroom break. It's made a bit of space. We're going to send you over to Steve. Mm, thanks, Barney. How wonderful you get to see a lovely leopard and cub. How special is that? Well, we've been looking for some today. Haven't found any tracks. Trish was on some tracks for a female. But our lions have crossed out. But anyway, you're back with us and the kettle is boiling. You can see the steam is coming out. And the decoction essentially is you're boiling the water down. You're making a reduction. The uh, difference between a decoction and an infusion. An infusion is generally when you use it for leaves or things like that, you make like a tea. So a tea, when you make tea and you take a kettle and you boil the water and you pour that hot water over your tea bag, it's an infusion. You're letting something steep inside the water. And then once it gets the color you want, some people like strong tea, some like weaker tea. So that's a stronger versus weaker infusion then you drink that and you get the benefits of those plant parts. But in a decoction, we're really trying to break down the active ingredients inside that vegetation. And it looks like our plant is looking very, very good. I'm going to just grab out one of those to see if maybe you can see the difference between that and a fresher one. No, not really. Apart from it being wet, you can't really see it. But um, as I said before, you can chew this, you can chew these Seems like my gas bottle's running low. But anyway, the colors changed lovely. So you can chew this. You can chew it as a... Oh, it is absolutely bitter. I'm going to try chewing the other one. See how if it's less bitter. I don't know how you're supposed to stomach that. It's not nice. So you can chew it as a... Oh, to to warm yourself up, help you to perspire. And it's, see that my, I've got another gas bottle, but this gas bottle has died on me, but that's good. I pumped it at the end there. Let's let this cool slightly. So you can chew this to warm yourself up, help you to perspire, and that's good for colds, flus, and it has been used traditionally for mouth ulcers and sores. Now, bear in mind, everyone, I do these traditional Tuesdays or medicinal Mondays, bringing back indigenous plants, uh, traditional beliefs, traditional knowledge. Um, and please don't go and take these, um, uh, these ideas that I'm putting forward and go to your doctor and say, listen, you're giving me the wrong prescription. I need to go get something of what Steve has got. So uh, make sure if you are on prescription medication, you stick with that and you uh, follow um, medical advice rather than saying Steve who is not a doctor, told me to do this. So I'm just trying to educate and show you some traditional beliefs and stuff that's been passed on from generation to generation. Okay, so we're going to pour out our decoction 
Now into my lovely little cup over here. And you can't really see too much of a change in the color there. And a sieve is really nice because what the sieve does is it allows you to catch all the bits and pieces that you can throw away. Throw away. But I brought my lovely syringe, which is always great for, for picking up and to show you the color. I don't know if you can see that quite nicely against the white, perhaps. Is that coming out nicely, Nils? So that is essentially what the decoction has allowed it to do. You probably wouldn't get the same amount of color. Um, you'd probably get more color if you boiled it even longer, but you wouldn't get the same amount of color if you just did an infusion, especially with bark or roots. So we'll leave that there. I'm just going to add a little bit of cold water because you want to be able to, you want to be able to drink some of this just now. And uh, in Zimbabwe, this tree is used as, as, as a panacea, which basically means a cure-all. They use it for all sorts of treatments and ailments. Um, abdominal pain. Now, abdominal pain refers to anything from your chest down to your sort of kidneys and bladder region. So they use it for all sorts of things. Anything that's making them feel bad inside, chest complaints, stomach complaints, diarrhea, constipation. And those things are something that these people would administer and this would help them to clear so it's almost like one of those tablets that we take these days that just takes away all the pain except many of these things are found in nature which is always so wonderful um decoctions have also been used to be <laughs> wonderful to learn this stuff as well it is indeed now a decoction of the root i haven't got the root now but it's been used for diarrhea for for worms and parasites so internal parasites such as worms it helps to clean out the digestive system and you know a lot of these things are possibly reasons why elephants are seen this time of year feeding very much on the bark you'll find them this is the wood that i've managed to cut down it's quite a quite a solid piece of wood and um, elephants will actually turn it in their mouth pulling all that bark off which they'll then chew with a very straight face or should i say a very long nose face and not pull weird faces like I do, eating that and ingesting it. Obviously, they don't have the potential to boil it down like we do, uh, but they will digest a lot of that. A lot of it will be broken down in the gut. And I think they're smart enough to know when they're feeling ill, certain plants will bring in the benefit that they, that they need. Um, and humans have actually used these for furniture and for making axe handles. That's quite a solid piece of wood there. I could definitely hurt somebody with that. Okay, so the bark decoction has also been used uh, for steaming, you can steam it and get the, the, the steam coming up and sore eyes, uh, any sort of ailments you might have with your eye sockets, maybe a bit of dust if you want to clean that out, quite helpful. Um, but with animals, elephants have a very big issue with colic, same as horses, which is basically a big bloated gastral intestinal issue. And it is very well known to be treated for, for treating colic. So um, it's probably one of the major reasons. All the abdominal pain, if you see the size of the elephant's stomach chamber, there's so much going on in there. They devour this bark like it's no one's business. So let's come to that time, everybody. Pinky up. I'm feeling quite wonderful as it is. It's bitter, but they say medicine is supposed to be bitter. It's not disgusting. Ah, oh, Niels, would you like to try some just now? I'll save you some. I'm just double checking I've got everything. So they've also been used in, um, as I said, sore eyes, blood purification. It's quite a popular sort of remedy in many African cultures. Um, but this plant, a wonderful plant, ecologically, it grows all over the park. Wonderful shade, great for keeping the flies away. And if you have any stomach pains, body pains what a plant to deal with so i'm going to give Niels some of this in a short little while there is the color one more time let's just spray it into the wilderness thank you for joining me for my first middle monday back in the seat i look forward to joining you and spending more time with you over the coming weeks in instructing or showing you some wonderful plant parts and remedies from the african wilderness and i think shortly we're going to be sending you back over to someone i'm not quite sure who Welcome back everybody. Now, very exciting news. Unfortunately, we couldn't stick with that female 
Cheetah and her two cubs, they went into a deep river bed where unfortunately a vehicle couldn't get into. But one of our researchers has found a different female cheetah, a cheetah we haven't been able to show you just yet. And it's a young female. So she goes through there, She's giving us a bit of a hard time keeping up with her in this thick bush. Please hold tight as we go through these little like ravines and stuff. There she goes, there she goes, there she goes. So this is a young female that we haven't seen for a long time, everybody. She's recently independent of her mother. There she goes. And she's come into this part of the reserve, everybody. We think in search of a mate. Now, she is very, very, very far from where she grew up as a cub, her and her sister, and, and where her mother still lives. And we are pretty sure that she's here, like I said, in search of a mate. There's two dominant male cheetahs that live in this area. And we've been watching her very carefully. She's been walking and smelling often, smelling all the big trees where a male cheetah would have sent marked. There she comes, yeah. There she goes. Very, very, very exciting news, everybody. She, like I said, oh, she's going to come into the open, yeah? Just give her a second. See how she's walking in a zigzagging pattern as well. She's not walking straight for very long. There she goes. Giving us a hard time trying to keep up. Oh, there's a big hole. <laughs> Great to hear that all of you are so excited. I know I'm super excited. It's been so good to see so many female cheetah on Pinder currently with youngsters. And if she's successful in finding a mate, we could have even more cubs on the way. There she goes. Now also while she's moving through the thickets like this, she'll of course, if she does come across like a, maybe a small daker or a steenbok, um, she might try to take the opportunity to hunt. Girl, you're saying that she's, she's super fast. She certainly is and gives me like a little bit of a heart, a heart attack every time she takes off. Trying to keep up with the cheetah can be quite tough at times. Look at how she's, again, she's moving in this zigzagging pa uh, fashion. So even though she is looking on or looking for a mate, she'll also be looking for food and that kind of zigzagging will help her to give her a better chance of maybe flushing something out of the thick bush. But I'm super excited to see where she leads us. So I'm gonna try and stick with her. Yeah, sure. So, to give you some perspective of why that little meerkat is sitting huddled up against the bush over there, is our real field temperature here is between minus two and minus four. Um, that's what we've got. Um, Veronique, the meerkat, a bit of her phone is saying where we're standing at now. It's minus four. Uh, mine says minus two at our research center. So, this pretty nippy and with this what's actually caused it now is with this breeze that's now picking up that wind chill that's what's creating this this drop in temperature now um i don't know how much foraging these little meerkats are going to be doing during the course of today um, and this really really worries me now and remember i said that a, a two days ago with these um with an extended cold period this is what can be absolutely lethal for for young animals and I'm, and I'm not just talking about um, meerkats here you know it could be anything that was born late in the season um, you know because we had a decent rainfall season so there was lots of food around but anything that was born late with these clouds coming in um, that's nasty for little animals so anyway let's let's hold thumbs um, we know down these burrows they're gonna be super snug super warm so Andrew's asked how will the cold front impact larger animals they, they're not gonna worry too much about it um, okay there's not much I can do about it certainly 
Um, but they're not going to worry too much about it here. They've got a bigger body size that generates a lot of heat. Um, if there's an animal that's compromised, that's very different. In other words, perhaps you've got a very old animal um, with the teeth are very worn. Um, it's not, it's battling to get enough sustenance from the food that it's eating, you know, to, to chew that food properly. Um, so the body condition might be a little bit down. Those animals, even if they're large, will be compromised by weather like this. Um, so yeah, and just so you all know, Jandre with all this footage that he's getting, and, and not just Jandre, the other cameraman as well, these cameras have all got steel handles, and you know how cold this metal is. I can stick my hands in my pockets of these. Well, Jandre is sitting there, he's got gloves, but the gloves don't cover the whole hand. Stick your hand in front of the camera, Jandre. So, <laughs> so look how slowly his fingers are moving. Those cameras get icy, icy, icy cold, especially in weather like this. So, good job there. But yeah, I don't think these meerkats are going to be moving too much today. So this young man has been moving around a lot more than the sister has. He's went back into the same spot where he was lying. But it does look like there's something that he's hearing that we don't hear. He keeps on changing direction and looking completely on the opposite way to where the carcass is. It makes me think that maybe the mother might, might have headed on that direction. Or it could be even be something like a hyena that might be close by. He, at this moment in time, doesn't look scared and too bothered. But he doesn't seem to want to take his eyes off whatever it is that he saw on the other side. And at the same time... There is that one fly that is really bothering him big time. You can see how he keeps on shaking his head every few seconds or so. But it's getting warm now and the spot he is on is possibly the dream type of, sp type of spot for him. In particular now when the sun becomes hotter and hotter, that he might stay there for a while longer without really doing much. And as for the sister, of course she's chosen the thickest dense bush there is around here. We only saw a glimpse of her, a little bit of movement every now and again, but she has not been as active as he is. So I do think that he might be the one that's gonna digest more and maybe head back towards the tree to feed again. But the mother here, we have not seen any signs of the mother yet. But I know for a fact that she is around because this is the direction where she was last seen heading with them yesterday afternoon so while we wait here listening to all different types of things making noises and birds calling we are hoping to see him getting up or maybe take us back to the tree which doesn't look like he's gonna do that anytime soon looking at out he just put his head down so yeah, it's a beautiful drainage line they are on. What we will possibly do from here on, we might even drive this drainage line slightly up just to see if we don't see any signs of the mother because I know that she's around. She's just having really come back close to where they are. So what she's already doing, she's trying to spend as little time as possible with them even on the carcass because she's preparing herself and them because I think it's only a matter of time that before she kicks both of them out of the area. Like I pointed out earlier on, if there is no carcass, she, carcass that she's killed that they're coming to feed together, she's all, also putting them in separate places. And we've seen yesterday on Eric's drive when she was moving with that young female, every now and again when that female gets close by, the mother is growling. So she's trying to break that bond already so that it's going to be easier for her to leave them one day. So what will possibly happen with that, it's often not going to be the same time that she leaves both of them. In most cases, they should leave the young female first because that is a direct competition for food, for territory, and also for, for, the, uh, for the males, which they, the male that's the dominant male here at that time. So yeah, while we sit and want to see how most of this unfold and talk, want to talk more about the story later, we're going to send you to Damon with the cheaters.
she's finally stopped everybody after after a lot of bushwhacking we've managed to keep up with her and she's just sat down for a second look at how her mouth is hanging a little bit open she's panting a little bit after all of her walking and running and she's come up the hill from where we first saw her she's probably walked about maybe 500 meters from where we first found her and now with this added height advantage she's busy scanning the grasslands around her like i said looking for both mate and prey and like i said earlier she's been smelling every single big tree that we've come past every single prominent marker and because of kind of the the scarceness of those kind of markers in this area they are almost like, like marking posts or not or bulletin boards even if you will for male cheetah where they'll go and leave their scent knowing that other cheetah will then come and smell those posts and that they'll then be able to find out if there's either other males that have come into their territory or if there's females nearby and she'll be looking of course to go and smell those posts too to see how long ago the, the resident dominant males were here but here she goes you might be able to see now just a oh okay she's gone into the shade a little bit everybody there's a herd of zebra that's right in front of us walking towards her as well as a small group of white rhinos isn't this just amazing zebra cheetah and rhinos and also a wildebeest all within the one same little hundred square meters or so well maybe no, a bit more than that <laughs> well the same little area rather now look at how she's gone into the shade here just to afford herself a bit of extra cover look at how much better she kind of disappears into that thicket there while she's sitting in the sun and she's out in the open much easier to see whereas now that she's in the shade she'll be able to be a bit less conspicuous have a look at how have a look at those those rhinos up on the hillside there none of them currently looking in her direction but it looks like a few of these zebra have given her a cursory glance now with all of those zebras being adults and because there aren't any foals in that herd they won't be they won't be concerned by the presence of just a lone female cheetah so they're probably just going to continue Anna Marie you're saying that this is so iconic I absolutely agree with you Anna Marie especially for this area of South Africa and for us at Ambion Pinda Private Game Reserve these are two species that we are well known for in terms of our conservation of them both the cheetah and the white rhino so super special to be able to show you them in the same shot i think she's just taking a bit of a time out here everybody the sun is like i said it's not not very hot but the sun is quite intense look at how clear the sky is and in that fur coat of hers she'll no doubt be getting a little bit warm also with all of her moving around we saw her darting between thickets a little bit earlier guys she's planning her next move she's looking around deciding there she goes she almost looked like she was gonna have a well start stalking that wildebeest it's much too big for you girlie don't try that also just remarking looking at looking at her body Oh, look at her. I don't think... I don't think she's stalking, but look at how she's keeping her ears... pinned flat. Oh, look at how she's now got them pinned back and she's... She's... It almost does look like she's gonna stalk everybody. Let's watch and see what happens here. Emma, you're saying that her eyes... Oh, look, what are you doing? There she goes! What are you doing? <laughs> Look at that! She's caused panic! There's rhinos running, there's zebras running, there's wildebeest. <laughs> She's caused panic! <laughs> that was ridiculous! But did you see how she didn't really... She didn't really give it... Give it a good go. She kind of just cantered in at them. And and when the wildebeest didn't run, did you see how she kind of like tapped off a little bit? As if to say, oh, this, this, this wildebeest is not running away from me. What do I do? Do I carry on chasing or <laughs> how does this work? 
And even the even the rhinos ran. They of course just saw the, the zebras and the wildebeest running. Elizabeth, you're saying silly young cheetah. I suppose, I don't know, maybe she thought that there was maybe a, a young wildebeest calf there or who knows, maybe just for for the fun of it, for the fun of the chase. But how, well, let's just stop right here. That's going to be a beautiful, a beautiful shot, everybody. Again, if you've got your, get ready for some screenshots with the cheetah and the zebra. Annette, you say that you think that she's just having fun. Annette, it certainly looked like it. Like I said, I don't know what she would have stood to gain from that. Unless she thought that there was perhaps something small there that she could have caught. Listen to the alarm calls now. The zebra's alarm calling at her. And they're standing their ground. Watching her carefully. Now, of course, the, with her being so small, they know that she's not a threat to them. And they'll want to keep an eye on her and keep alarm calling at her to let other animals in the area know that there's a cheetah here. And also to let her know that, hey, we've seen you, don't, don't try anything with us. How? That was insane, everybody. My goodness. Causing chaos, coming from a different part of the reserve in search of a mate and then just chasing zebras and wildebeests and even rhinos. <laughs> Ridiculous. Now she's just going behind that, that thicket there. So let's try and catch up with her again. While we try and catch up with her though, everyone, let's go and see what Steve's up to. Thanks, Damon. Isn't that quite incredible? I actually had a post last night on Instagram saying exactly that. Herd animals hang out together in groups, but sometimes those groups get unmanageable and they get uncoordinated. But predators take advantage of running into the herds, causing pandemonium and then selectively removing an individual. But I don't think that young cheetah is going to do that. But I love it when I talk about things and they come to fruition. What have we found over here in the road? Well, none other than a big steaming pile of elephant poo. And look at what he's been feeding on. This is the African weeping wattle branch over here. Um, and look how it's taken the branch Let's put it, this is what an elephant does, it's called corkscrewing. Puts the branch in the mouth and it turns the branch like this with its molars. And um, basically you can see how it's been breaking it off, breaking it along. It doesn't have a knife like I do. So the bark is displaced by the molars as it crunches the wood. It's not looking to eat the wood, but it's definitely breaking the wood to get access to the bark we just spoke about. And look how at the end of the leaves where the, the bark is less and the leaves are untouched. And then the elephant does a very nice sustainable agriculture practice of cut and drop. And now that is on the ground and that will provide a small amount of shade or microclimate in its own right, same as the poo. So right here, again, the elephant has done the same thing, exactly the same thing. It's damaged quite a large piece of this plant. Poor tree, the tree is being hedged by the elephant, but you can see along the width over here, or the length here, that it's been broken to get access to that bark over there. And into the tree it goes. Once again, another one, same purpose. It's like eating a, a corn, a corn of the cob, with your whole mouth. Imagine stick one of them in, but then you get to the one end, you go back to the other side. That's what the elephant does. So very nice behavior known as corkscrewing, but very interestingly, they do not touch the leaves. So no nutrients in the leaves that they're looking for. And the leaves are very seldomly browsed. Maybe the young shoots by giraffe and black rhino, but other than that, not at all. So we'll just put that back again. I like to move them out the road because essentially what you're doing is creating that microclimate for the animals, for more happening up there. Lots of little microclimates, the cut and drop. And that is changing the shade dynamic and the organic material dynamic. Okay, well, very good. We're going to carry on down the road. Um, who knows where we're going to head to? Who knows what's going to pop up in the next five minutes? But uh, I know who's going to pop up on your screen next. The Trishala.
I don't know where I'm going. I do. I'm in the hyena den block. I've just been going kind of just up and down. See if I can see signs of anybody hanging around here. Nothing is so far. I did check in the actual den and nothing there too. Sometimes it's just about finding that sweet spot, that gap. Um, in the day and in the temperature that the cubs feel comfortable and the adults will be around. Oh no, I'm totally out of sync. <laughs> that must look quite funny. I'll send you to Ingala. Hopefully they'll be in sync. Welcome back to Envyongala. We were still seeing earlier on about these two leopards that have not moved that much at all. We tried moving around. We've got a little bit of a view of the female herself. Can only see her belly there. She is really, really full. Don't blame her for not wanting to move at all. And back to the story of how we are think we think that they don't have that much time with the mother herself because now since we've been here she has been nowhere and back to yesterday's afternoon's drive with Eric how the mother was hissing and growling to this young female as they move along. I haven't really seen her interact with the male lately but she will have she'll still be a little bit more tolerant to him than to her because he is not a direct competition to her he she is a direct competition competition to the mother. So, we think that it's just a matter of time until she decides that they need to go, but she might give up part of her territory to this young female. And while it often happens, it will be randomly maybe in a carcass where she gets up and take one of them and just move away and leave the other one and don't look back. And of course, for the first while, when the mother just leaves them, they stick around on the area where they are, hoping that the mother will return back. But then after over time, when they realize that there is no lack of that happening, they start slowly but surely moving around and trying to find things for themselves. Then, of course, that right. is a difficult time on their life because as much as they might have hunted something small on the mother's absentia, they are not as experienced as she is because this is really an experienced mother. She's done so well to get both of them to this age and making them look as healthy as they look as far as hunting. And that is really, really good. I agree with you 100%. Seeing a leopard is possibly one of my favorite things to do out in the, in the bush. In particular, when it comes to these ages, when we start thinking about things before they get done. So we're gonna yeah, also leave these leopards now and send you over to watch the fighting impala. So that maybe we'll come back to have a look at them in the afternoon if they're still around. So we are enjoying this quite a spectacular sparring match from these two male impalas. It really is a sparring match because this isn't the season when they are mating, but look how they jump and turn and hop. Look at the tails flicking. There's a lot of excitement. Either one of them could be badly injured in, 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 this, in this fight if they're not careful. But, oh, look at them, look at them. Showing off their fitness and their strength. This is really awesome. don't often get to see uh, these kind of sparring matches outside of the rutting season, which should have finished more than a month ago now. Look at the dust being thrown up. The footwork, it's amazing to watch their feet because they really have to always counterbalance themselves. Oh, there's a larger impala coming to break it up. See how they're licking their lips constantly? It's also probably part of the flemin, you know, when they test the air and they taste things and they get more information. Oh, oh seen them off, look at that. The younger Impala saw off the, the older one. So you can imagine they can really hurt themselves. Look how sharp the ends of those horns are. One wrong move and they could stab into the neck, poke out the eye, something like that. I've seen an Impala once with a broken horn in its neck. I'm sure it was just fine after a while, but it must have been very painful. 
for both, actually, because if the horn breaks on an Impala, it's like breaking your arm. It's not going to grow back. Or breaking your arm off, I suppose, because your arm would heal. Sometimes these matches start off and they look like they're just sparring and then they can get more aggressive as time goes. Especially if they're evenly matched, which these two both seem to be. I don't think they're fully grown just yet. Maybe around three years old, maybe a little older, but uh, certainly not as big as that first Impala we saw. So, very exuberant. <laughs> Sarah, it does look like breakdance fighting. This is awesome. There's a lot of movement, a lot of spinning and twisting. I've seen Impalas before, you know, really fall over, and then it really does look like breakdance fighting with their feet up in the air and the other one's pushing them around. Nothing wrong with a good breakdance fight once in a while. Settle your disputes. Oh, ouch, that looks a bit sore. You can really see the muscles and the glistening coats on the, these Impalas look very strong and healthy. Let's not have murder on the dance floor. See, every now and again, they, they just uh, stop and they listen. Remember, this is, makes them very vulnerable. Oh, oh, that doesn't look very good. If I did the splits like that, I'd be in a lot of pain. So every now and again, they have to stop and listen around. This makes them very vulnerable. You imagine they don't want to hurt or they don't want to get hurt, so they're focusing their attentions on those sharp horns of their opponent. And at any moment, a leopard or a lion could sneak up to them and grab one of them. So you actually have to be... Um, they have to be very vigilant. You know, interestingly, um, not so long ago, I found two kudus that had somehow managed to get their horns locked together, like this, like they are now, completely locked together. The one had died. It was very interesting. So this one was still alive, standing with the dead kudu attached to him. And we managed to, you know, get involved and try and see if we could help. And we actually found that the dead kudu that was still attached to the horns of the live one had been partly fed on by a leopard. It was incredible. I mean, I mean that just goes to show how, how focused they must have been. And then this leopard came in, obviously, when it noticed that they were caught together. Look at that. Look how they get the angles together. Yeah, dude, that, that, the kudu thing was super crazy. Oh, push him into the ground. Let's see if this is going to finish this. Finish him. Anyone ever played Mortal Kombat? So I've not seen an Impala uh, rut like this outside of the breeding season for a long time. So this is really, really awesome to see. Look at the wide stance and the rippling muscles. And this is important. When it comes time for the rutting season, it, it then really does become almost life and death. So if they don't practice now, they're going to really struggle in the, in the rutting season, which is around April, May time usually. It's an awesome view. It sounds like you're all enjoying my little references that I come up with. Well, you know, that's what the world's all about. It's about, it's what being guiding is all about. It's about finding ways to bridge what we're seeing to what's happening in front of us and create little memories. Well, these Impalas are really going for it. And our time is almost up with you all. It's been absolutely a phenomenal morning. It sounds like you've all seen great stuff. And uh, hopefully a lot more of the same this afternoon. We'll see you all there. Enjoy your day. Bye.